In the show tonight, we unpack the unreliability of memory. We dwell in the extreme excrement of the Republican National Convention, unfortunately. Ask whether Christopher Nolan is directing the 2020 election. Pause for beer. And then we settle into a discussion of science, the scientific method, and what we learn about ourselves. Spoiler alert, it's more about the emotion than about the facts. You know I'm totally off script right now. Point of order. We are traversing uncharted territory. Listen properly. Are we in an auction here? We are now required to rise. Honorable member. Just a joke, but it's true. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Please, Russia, please. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. Get us Hillary Clinton's emails. All on all of us. Just leave us alone. One and all. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. To play our part. I want you to get mad. The faith of this nation is eternal. And my vice president has shot someone. Good morning, and welcome to the seventh, i.e. sixth, episode of Less Talk. And to summer, returning to the city. What an amazing feeling. My name is Neil de Villiers, and if I were a Trump, I'd be Ivanka. I mean, she has a very special relationship with daddy, and Trump being my daddy would just make me so happy. I'm joined in studio, I say studio, it's really more of a warehouse, by recondite Rob Cass, who would be... I'm going to exercise my freedom of association to not associate with the Trumps. <laughs> <laughs> I will not. Oh, my Either. gosh. There's a mutiny. There's a, there's, a, there's a mutiny uh, happening here. No, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> I second that motion. I was if also I going to, to say I refuse. <laughs> you guys can't refuse. <laughs> Rob, I'm pushing you. Which Trump? Pick one. Okay. Uh, Pick one or your Tiffany. On the, on the, okay, That's on the, the spot. Deal. I'm Donald Trump's dad because I'm dead and I'm a dead Trump. There <laughs> <laughs> we go. <laughs> near enough, near enough, yeah. As well as jocular Johannes Landman or Johannes Landman, who would make an amazing Trump. Uh, firstly, I'm insulted by that. And secondly, Rob, I'm really disappointed that you capitulated that easily. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the witch Trump. I'm just going to sit here with my mouth closed. <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a mutiny on our hand. And finally, a man who I know is gnashing his teeth at me right now for this intro. It seems like everyone is, really. We have Albanian, Andrew Park. I am not from Albania and uh, so ready to choose my Trump. I am Fred Jr. Uh, he, was, uh, he seems like my kind of guy. He's supposed to run the business, uh, but he turned out to be a little bit too lazy. Uh, looked around, saw how <laughs> crazy the rest of his family was, uh, and just, you know, down to his chap, put his head down and drank himself to death. Um, that's, that sounds like me to a T. If I was a Trump, it would have gone exactly the same way. <laughs> really? He really, he really drank yeah. himself to death? For his. Yeah, he was supposed to oh, run the shit. business. His dad rejected him. And, so tell uh, me... Uh, the chap got to drinking. So tell me, when do we get our checks from the Trump campaign? In the mail. <laughs> in the mail already, Rob. I mean, oh. this kind of support. <laughs> How are you doing today, Rob? I'm good. I'm good because there is a new Bright Eyes album out. And I know there's going to be a lot of people that will give me hell for, for loving bright eyes at my old age, but I do. And I've, I've realized, and I'm going to use some bad science to back it up because in this episode, we're going to be talking about bad science, but there, this is the first new bright eyes album since 2011. And I remember distinctly 2011 being way less crazy than the world is right now. And I was a lot happier in 2011. So <laughs> therefore there is evidence to suggest that a new bright eyes album could mean that the world is going to be a better place. Very good. And already like that's that. manifesting because Rob is looking and feeling happier. <laughs> Indeed. Well, it certainly made my world a better place. <laughs> <laughs> your theory is self-fulfilling. Joe, how's your week? Uh, my week's awesome. I moved into a new apartment today and that's a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. but it's also really cool when it's done. And How many over the stairs? Weekend, 39 stairs to the second floor. How which 39? I probably... Which engineer designed that? What? Yeah, yeah there's, there's one set which is, which is not the same as the others. What? <laughs> it's three tens and a nine. Um, and I, I look forward to over the weekend so the finding floor homes. Is smaller, a step smaller than the than the third floor. You, I can't recall. You must which measure it. Floor. Please measure it from my OCD. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can come have a beer and you can measure it while I'm frying. Andy, how about yourself, man? How are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. Hmm? Andrew's an open <laughs> book, isn't he? Mike, drop. 
Good. Uh, Good. Don't yeah, worry, man. All the uh, factories uh, are running okay. full steam. We've got tons of smog over. waiting for you. Yeah, it's all yeah. it's all here. But I mean, you can see the, the smog in Cape Town the same you can, as you can see the smoke in uh, Joburg, especially when the wind isn't blowing. But let's get ready to rumble. So, from one shouting idiot to another, um, and for our audience, if you didn't listen to last week's episode, I'm referring mm. to myself. The morning rant this week will be taken by none other than Kimberly Guilfoyle during her address at the RNC, the Republican National Convention. For those of you who don't know, Kimberly was a former Fox News host, turned spouse to Don Jr. And just as a side, Don, please save us all from scratching our eyes out with blunt nails and shave that god-awful excuse for a beard. And now is the Trump campaign's national finance chair. It all starts out pretty relaxed. Apologies, I, I sorry. The Trump's... National, the Trump campaign's national finance chair is the president's daughter-in-law. Uh, they're not married. Oh. They're not married. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So um, it, it all starts out pretty relaxed. Good evening, America. The plastic I'm surgery Kimberly did not Gilfoyle. go well. I speak to you tonight as a mother, a former prosecutor, a Latina, and a proud American. And yes, a proud supporter of President Donald J. Trump. I'm getting Why? sick. Why? because he is the president who delivers for America. He built the greatest economy the world has ever known for the strivers, the working class and middle class. As commander in chief, he always puts America first. President Trump is the law and order president. Now presidential leadership is not guaranteed. It is a choice. Biden, Harris, and the rest of the socialists will fundamentally change this nation. So there in that first clip, you can already hear her toying with a very special register in her voice. Probably a register her voice never even wanted to get into. In fact, her voice would have been quite happy retiring after the Fox News stint and sipping pina coladas on the beach. But no, Kim had to start dating Don Jr. The voice started wondering what kind of severance packages it could negotiate from her. If you want to see the socialist Biden-Harris future for our country, just take a look at California. It is a place of immense wealth, immeasurable innovation, and immaculate environment. And the Democrats turned it into a land of discarded heroin needles in parks, riots in streets, and blackouts in homes. In President Trump's America, we light things up. We don't dim them down. We build things up. We don't burn them down. We kneel in prayer and we stand for our flag. So just interestingly for everyone in South Africa, the blackouts in California were caused by the fires. So that is really what she's referring to. But just to get back to Kim's voice, it realized suddenly that Kim was heading dangerously close to dictator territory. Being hammered by that Botox-filled robot-like face 24-7 isn't easy, you know. A voice works hard. It's okay, it tells itself. Just a few more years of this and she'll be old and tired enough to let me go. Do you support the cancel culture, the cosmopolitan elites of Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden? who blame America first. Do you think America is to blame? Yes. Or do you believe in American <laughs> greatness? Believe in yourself, in President Trump, in individual and personal responsibility. They want to destroy this country and everything that we have fought for and hold dear. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology to the point that you will not recognize this country or yourself. Oh, shit, the voice thought to itself. Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> Much more of this and I won't be able to hold on, <laughs> the voice postulated. There wouldn't be much point in pina coladas if you're so raspy you can't drink them, it thought. His promise was to put America first and he has. When President Trump cut middle class taxes, putting tens of thousands of dollars back in the pockets of working class Americans, that beacon began to flicker once again. 
When President Trump commanded the defeat of ISIS, took out al-Baghdadi and Soleimani, and paved the way for peace in the Middle East, that beacon started to glow. When he negotiated historic trade deals with Canada, Mexico, Japan, and China, bringing back thousands of manufacturing jobs to America, that beacon shined bright once again for the world to see. Holy hand grenade, the voice exclaimed. She's completely lost it. She can't even Jesus phrase crap. properly anymore. It's gonna blow. America, it's all on the line. President Trump believes in you. He emancipates and lifts you up to live your American dream. You are capable, you are qualified, you are powerful, and you have the ability to choose your life and determine your destiny. Donald Trump is Jesus Christ? He's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna do what now? The voice was beyond perplexed. This constant tone-deaf forcefulness had actually given it cluster headaches and tinnitus. It had had enough. It left Kimberly to fend for herself in the empty hall she was shouting at. Brilliant phrasing, the voice quipped while it boarded its flight to Hawaii. You can achieve your American dream. You can be that shining example to the world. Manifest and be the change in this country that you dream, that you hope, that you believe in. Stand for an American president who is fearless, who believes in you, and who loves this country and will fight for her. President Trump is the leader who will rebuild the promise of America and ensure that every citizen can realize their American dream. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders and fighters for freedom and liberty and the American dream, the best is yet to come. You guys know that Steve Carell meme from The Office where he's like, I don't know what we're shouting about. I just feel like someone just sold me timeshare. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sorry for Don Jr. all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, me, <laughs> but, but not with that beard. Way in my life. Do you think he's maybe been trying to break up with her for like a couple of years now and he's just like, just doesn't get a chance to speak. I think they only got, got together like a year ago or whatever, less than a year ago. But I think just for our audience, you got to go check this clip because the only thing that's more scary than listening to it is actually watching it. Yeah, she basically agreed. smiles throughout the whole thing and not like that natural kind of American, not even American, homely smile, not a true smile. She smiles like Christian Bale in fucking Psycho, man. Her smile it's maniacal. is as fake as everything <laughs> coming out of her mouth. And, and you know what I find really interesting is the, the comparison between... You've got uh, kind of gospel preachers, dictators, and this. I mean, when I look at those shots, please, audience, we'll, we'll link the video in the show notes, but go and have a look. When I look at those shots and she's like throwing up her hands and whatever, it's like she's channeling Hitler, but she's not Hitler. Um, it's, it's very disturbing for me. And for someone to try and appeal to people's emotions on that kind of level, I just feel is... It is delusional, and I think The Voice did the right thing by getting out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not think it's so crazy that this lady is just standing there shouting at an empty hall? Yeah. That's the most comic thing about it. Yeah. And then yeah. I started thinking, but imagine the film crew that's like, what the fuck did we sign up <laughs> for, dude? <laughs> So, uh, thanks for sticking with me, guys. I know it was long. I tried to make it short. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that was a disturbing outing. Um, but thank you for sharing. Yeah, what, what else have you got for us, Joe? Well, it's, it's interesting watching it. I've been reading, you know, my, my standard morning this news is the, coverage. This is the Steve Carell meme for everyone <laughs> who doesn't know it. <laughs> um, I've, I've been reading a lot about the RNC as part of my standard morning news coverage. And the, the concept that came up in the New York Times, and they really must declare their bias. They, they hate Donald Trump and they think he's evil. They might be right factually, but that's their bias, um, is, is the, the idea of a cult of personality where there is no substantive policy discussion. In fact, they looked up the policy document that the Trump campaign released at the convention, which is what you do every four years. And it... I'm not making, well, they, I'm quoting them who I don't believe are making this up. It references the 2016 document. So it doesn't actually outline policy, 
it says, go look at the 2016 one. And then apparently there, there's a bullet point summary, which in their reading is devoid of any factual, um, concrete proposal. It's exactly what you just heard there, big, empty words. Cult of personality and... and yeah, identity uh, politics. Hey? Yeah, yeah and, and also he's hijacked the party. So, so if you, if you contrast sure. it to the DNC 100%. last week, the DNC had various people from across the political spectrum, including Republicans who ran for president, yeah. um, saying things about policy and Biden and, and Harris. Whereas this is just Trump. It's all about the personality and nothing about the polity. Yeah, I just feel like he's, he's sitting on sa stage right with, with people fanning him <laughs> with banana leaves. <laughs> That's the only explanation for the way that people are talking. Which metaphorically he is. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just crazy that like tone that she hits is just fucking it, it's so put on um, and it's it's so fake and you can hear like she fucks up her phrasing like every second <laughs> time, you know, she she like she uh, uh, the one time I've watched this video a million times that at the close to the end of it. He's like she's like he's the president that will fight for this ah. and she like shakes her hair country and you're like no wait you, you yeah. got that wrong it yes. should have been this country not this country Objection, um, leading it's, the witness. it's painful it's cringe um oh what i what i actually wanted to say is that the dnc so, uh, multi, so multi multi racial um multi multi kind of faceted etc when trump when the on the first night of the rnc trump released a video of him in the white house um with a bunch of people Okay, who are all white. So there's the, there's the first thing for you. Then he turns to the first lady to his left. And not the first lady, the, f the first person, person that's standing to his left. And he says to her, what do you do, ma'am? And she says, no, I'm, uh, I'm a postal service worker. And obviously given the, the kind of thing. And then Trump says, oh, and we're treating you very well, aren't we? <laughs> and she says, yes. <laughs> and, fucking, and you're like, could this, could this, oh, is this dystopia? What is going on? <laughs> That's narcissism at its worst. Shall we move on? Yes, let's move on. I think, Rob, have you got a story for us about beer? So never wanting to miss an opportunity to talk about beer. I've got almost a counterpoint to my story last week, which mm. was a, a story about a brewery that, that named their beer after a Maori word, which turned out to mean something other than what they thought. I've now got a story about a brewery which named a beer after the Hindu deity Shiva. So this is a, a, a brewery, well, it's actually a collaboration of two breweries um, in New York, uh, Pressure Drop Brewing and Big Ditch Brewing, which brewed a beer which they called Aqua Shiva. <laughs> Whether or not that's a good thing is, uh, I think, debatable. <laughs> it's a name that doesn't ring true for me, but um, obviously caused massive outrage amongst uh, the Hindu population, or not even the Hindu population, but a, a, a outspoken proponent, self-claimed, you know, Hindu activist, obviously uh, got very upset about this and and caused a big fuss, and they ended up retracting not only the name, but decided that they wouldn't ever produce the beer again. And I think I don't want to get too much into the whether it's right or wrong. I just think it's an interesting counterpoint to someone, you know, when it's religion based, um, does it carry the same weight necessarily as something like culture or language or? Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting counterpoint for me. I, I won't uh, I won't <laughs> go too much down the line because uh, only I'm, questions and no answers, eh, Rob? <laughs> well, you're stimulating our audience to think. I like it. Donald Trump shows you that people want certainty, Rob. We don't want your questions. God damn you! Life is uncertain, bro. <laughs> Why couldn't they have just claimed they were talking about the Shiva character from Mortal Kombat? How about that? Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, it probably had they, like they, the, they nine, could have, the nine armed the label, goddess on the front. Yeah, if the label hadn't <laughs> featured Shiva in all its glory. Okay, well, they, they, yeah, you fucked yourself. There. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think it, it is interesting because one of the other things, there they have been a lot of, um, you know, Christian-based references in, in beers before and yes. don't tend to get much outrage over that although i have seen one actually there's a local example uh, a beer called harambe brewed by the 400 brewing company uh one of the they, it's a beer they brew every year and uh the second batch that he did or that they did um 
featured so it's based the the, the story around it is is based on harambe the gorilla yes. which yeah, yeah the yeah, meme, everyone yeah. knows that story um and the second one he did was was called like the resurrection or something like that and it featured the, the, the like a, a, a gorilla in in like a, a kind of deity pose a, a christian deity pose i'm not going to specifically <laughs> reference any more than that and uh and yeah, it's really struggled. Apparently, they really struggled to sell the product because of the Christian inference. But yeah, they they like um, that Lef is brewed, has been brewed by monks. For yeah, but look, that's, years. That's, that's that's an different. actual. That's not an actual. Making, it's not yeah. like the appropriation of it. Gentlemen, mm. I think it's time to pick up the tangent gavel. <laughs> I'm going to tangent gavel myself to yeah. show that I'm not biased. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, I respect we don't believe that. you for a second. I, re I respect that, Rob. <laughs> yeah, I respect that too. Maturity. <laughs> Mr. I Johannes a... Landman, let's have it. I... We've been waiting, ladies and gentlemen, we've been waiting for this for weeks here in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I give you the story of the Springbok in Lamo. Um, listeners, would you believe me if I said, I can't ask the people in the, in the podcast room because they all know the answer. Would you believe me if I said that the Springboks had their very own haka? Well, clearly no. they did. Yeah. It is called the Indlamu, which is the Zulu word for a warrior dance. And the brief history, which I encourage you to go watch the full video on Inherit South Africa, and I credit Michael Charton for everything I'm about to tell you. The man is a South African magician of history and words. Go check it out. It'll enrich your life. Um, the Indlamu was performed as an opposite number, as an opposing element to the Haka. And the story was that New Zealand started doing the haka only outside of their own country um, during the 1920s, uh, 19 teens and 1920s, which itself is a story. So, so you take a, a Maori kind of war dance, but you don't use it at home. There's something there. And then that was shattered when the Springboks toured New Zealand in 1921 and we played three matches. We drew the first two, so the third match was the deciding match. And for the hold first, on, hold on, we drew two of the three matches. So we won one. So okay, we yes. won one. They yeah. won one. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. Then the third match, home. So in the, New series, Zealand, the series, the decider. series decider. The series decider. For the first time in history, the New Zealanders perform the haka on home territory against the Springboks, and this is supposed to give them an advantage. But what they don't see coming is that as they perform the haka, a young white guy by the name of Philip Nell, who was born on the northern shores of the Tugela River and grew up playing with young Zulu black boys, leads the Springboks in an opposing war dance called their Injlamu. And the outcome of the game, we draw. <laughs> so that series um, uh, is a, a draw. That's 1921. Then in 1928, we play again this time, I believe the series was in South Africa. The New Zealanders perform the haka. The Springboks rebut with the Entlamu. Philip Nell at this point is the captain of the Springboks. And the outcome of that series is we draw. You can't make this stuff up. Now, fast forward to 1937. So it was 1921, 1928. It's 1937. The Springboks tour to New Zealand. There are, again, three games. Again, the first game is one by one. The other, the second by the other. We are in the series decider, not only of these three games, but of the last three tours over more than a decade. It is played at Eden Park, which my friends here, I know very little about rugby, say is called Eden Park. Michael Charton calls it Fortress Eden Park. It is so full that the hill opposite the stadium is crowded with watchers. And as the Springboks get up to perform the Ndlamu, what is the outcome of that game? It is the single best score the Springboks have ever made in history against New Zealand. Five tries to nil. The destruction. <laughs> and I just thought that was really cool, and I wanted to share that with you guys. That's cool. I, I, I like that. Andy, <laughs> I think it's time you bring us back to Earth. What you got for us? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm afraid it's more uh, Republican stuff. But uh, as Noam Chomsky says, they are the most dangerous organization in human history. So I suppose uh, <laughs> an update on those chaps is uh, you know, seldom goes amiss. So uh, this one is specifically about the QAnon conspiracy theory. Oh my gosh. So QAnon, just to <laughs> fill you in, grew out of the Pizzagate conspiracy of 2016. Uh -huh. If you've never heard that before, you, uh, you might not believe me. Pizzagate is in fact a thing. 
Yes. Which alleged that certain liberal politicians are part of a satanic cabal trafficking kids for sex in restaurants around Washington, D.C., and which prompted one man to discharge an assault rifle in a pizza parlor and demand that the kids downstairs be set free. And were they? Of course, there were no fucking kids downstairs. (laughs) (laughs) But believers were undeterred, concluding that he had simply walked into the wrong pizza place by mistake. (laughs) Can you believe it? (laughs) So what's changed since then? There's now some controversy in the group as to the nature of QAnon's villains. Uh, They've more or less narrowed it down to Satanists, interdimensional demons, or psychic vampires. I love it. Okay, still still feeling this question. Yeah, no, we're right Um, here on terra firma there. Yeah, with you. (laughs) (laughs) Absolute. Okay, they believe that Trump is secretly battling against the deep state, a supposed alliance of these villains entrenched in the U.S. government. There is talk of an event known as the Storm the storm that will require them to take up arms in defense of the constitution. All right, getting a little dangerous here. (laughs) Over the last few months, many believers have taken an oath to this effect. Okay. An oath that they will take up arms when the storm comes, including Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, who got his whole family to take the oath on video while celebrating independence day. Last year, the FBI warned that QAnon and other conspiracy theories pose a credible threat to U.S. <laughs> national security. So, it seems like uh, common sense for anyone, perhaps even Donald Trump, to denounce this nonsense. Let's see what he had to say during a recent White House briefing. Soyce, my sausage, roll the clip. The cost of the theory is this belief that you are secretly saving the world from this satanic cult of pedophiles and cannibals. Does that sound like something you are behind? Or well, I haven't, I haven't heard that, but uh, is that supposed to be a bad thing or a good thing? I mean, you know, if, uh... Bring back the satanic panic is what I say. Right? And, and it's basically they like me so they can't be all bad. <laughs> the truth is irrelevant. Whether or not there are these, these, like, you know, cannibal Satanists, who cares? Who cares? These guys like me, right? So I like them and uh, keep up the good work. Actually, um, actually, and, what's the, the... Sorry, Andrew, if I can just interject there. The opposite is really more of the truth with fucking Trump's, like, um, friendship with Jeffrey Epstein and all of that stuff. It's actually... The, the, the opposite is closer to the truth than, than the conspiracy. Yeah, thing. liking Trump is not a good sign. Not a good sign at all. Um, it's, sadly, this isn't just Trump and Flynn, though. There are 20 Republicans, 20 candidates, now on the November ballot for the Senate or the House who have publicly supported QAnon at some time or another. Mm. How did we get here? How can people be so resistant to facts and reason? What drives them to accept wild speculation as gospel without a scrap of evidence? And what, if anything, can we do about it? These are some of the same questions posed by today's main topic, interacting with science. Just one thing before you start, Rob. Um, QAnon, uh, the representative from, from QAnon, someone couldn't make their second night of the RNC speech, and they got a representative from QAnon to stand in front of the fucking nation and speak as one of three or four whatever people that, that spoke at, the, at those things. It's the same as Kimberly Guilfoyle. Sorry, I just wanted to mention that because... Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know, man. It sounds like the plot of the new Batman movie. And if that was actualized in reality, that, that would be pretty rad. <laughs> they got Christopher Nolan to do it. <laughs> yeah, Christopher Nolan <laughs> directs <laughs> America 2020. <laughs> You'd do that a better job, Rob. really depressed me. I can't get excited out of, uh, about Batman anymore. I just I just see a rich guy fucking beating up poor people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. <laughs> well, moving on swiftly. <laughs> Before we get stuck in a hole. I'm warming up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about how we interact with science and in return how science interacts with us. So I'd like to start the story with talking about a an incident which happened uh, in the last couple of months at UCT, uh, which I think is a good lead on and, and a framing point for the, the discussion we're going to be having. So basically what happened, a lecturer and a, and a, um, 
a lecturer at UCT uh, by the name of Nikolai um, Natrix, I can look for you. Bi I name biology. Right, um, conducted some research along with the class that the intention okay. of the research supposedly was to figure out why so few black students enroll for biological sciences. And so they went and did a little bit of field research. Um, I think we'll, we'll put the link to both uh, the article and some of the um, rebuttals or the stories that have been written about this research in the show notes so people can go and read a bit more about it because I don't want to get too deep into it. But the point is they, they conducted this research and it was very much an exploratory study and they framed it as such. It was a two-page uh, article that they ended up producing and the idea of it was to say, you know, why are so few black students enrolling? And what they tried to do through a, a few interviews was to get some uh, kind of idea of what are the perceptions of the biological sciences and what are the factors or the determining factors that lead people into career choices that are either towards biological sciences or not. And one of the things that they supposedly came out of with this is that, and one of the main factors that I think has been a sticking point is that they tied aspirations, material aspirations to people choosing or not choosing uh, a career or choosing to study biological sciences. And this caused a lot of, um, a lot of controversy and uproar. And I think it's not beyond critique, the research itself. And I think people must go and read the research and decide for themselves, because I think there's a lot of valid criticisms. But the way these criticisms have been portrayed to me is what is problematic. And it's to me, uh, the reason why I wanted to talk about this topic, because we see a lot of this kind of stuff, and we'll get further into where this kind of crops up. But a, an organization called the Black Academic Caucus, uh, which frames itself as trying to drive transformation in the university, mm. they they caused the main outrage over this over mm. this research um, in in suggesting that it was racist. Mm. And as I said, I don't want to get too far into whether or not the research is racist. I think we will kind of circle back to it at the end and talk a little bit more about it. The way they've done it is it created this huge controversy and the UCT executive reacted to that in, in basically throwing her under the bus and mm. her research under the bus. Mm. And it's effectively kind of silenced a lot of the rational debate about the, whether the research itself is good or bad, whether mm. there's problems with the research itself. Um, I, one of the things she kind of came out when when she was when this first exploded, she came out to say, "Look, I'm not saying that you can't criticize my research. I'm totally fine with that. But no one's even kind of engaged with her on on an academic level to say these are the problems with your research. There's been these accusations that have been thrown out to the media of racism, and immediately that kind of stifles the the ability to have some kind of rational discourse on whether this is good or bad, and Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that people need to kind of feel a certain way about it or, or not, but I think, I think this is a good example of how our interaction with science and research can be problematic and can lead to outcomes that are not kind of helpful. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of get into a bit more of the nitty gritty if of I that. Can just, um, if I can just get in there, Rob, um, the executive management, a quote from them said, it labeled the paper as offensive to black students, to black people in general, and any academic understands that the quality of research is inextricably linked to its ethical grounding. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to carry on with this, but you can stop me and tell me to, to put this point later. But uh, just to use your words, <laughs> this, uh, Rob. Uh, this has potential to be hugely problematic, especially considering the, the stuff that I spoke about, that we spoke about last week, the Constitutional court's, court's judgment on rationality, saying the antiquity of a prejudice is no reason for its survival, that, that whole quote. And this is almost like tangential to that, because who decides on, on what is ethical and what is not well, ethical? Well, it's interesting you bring that up, because I, I actually support that statement completely. But as far as I know... There was an ethics clearance, and for people who, you know, with this kind of research, when you conduct research, you need an ethics clearance. 
from what I understand, they, they actually did get an ethics clearance to conduct this research. So there is a body, there's an ethics body in a university which decides on and the they, ethical nature uh, of But this. then if they're going to decide that it's okay, then for the management to throw under the pus when, um, when this thing becomes like it goes viral and everyone's up in arms is completely wrong. It's, 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 it's unethical, yes. actually. Yes. I've been through this process. I've been through this process at UCT. And what I think happened is um, because they do it quite early on. So I was also using questionnaires and psychometrics and so on. And they didn't ask to see what questions I was gonna gonna ask. They didn't ask to me, you know, how I was gonna analyze or interpret the data or anything like that. So uh, as far as I can recall, the the kind of ethical approval comes quite a lot earlier on. Um, so there is some stuff that you you know there are details to which you're you're left to decide I feel like yourself. still if that's the and if I, that's the I, body's outlook and they're going to conduct their kind of little investigation before you actually provide them with a questionnaire or not even require that you provide them with a questionnaire that's on I, them for now I, I feel like I'd just like to make my position clear that I I agree with the black academic caucus that this is a shit research and be incredibly offensive Tell us how you real, really feel, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> your, your point is noted. And, um, no. <laughs> Are you, Just um, before our listeners think like this is white guys about to complain that everything's about race these days. Yeah. Just, yeah. There's a little bit Just more so nuance to our show than that, Andrew. I <laughs> fucking yes. like to No, hope. Andrew, thank you for raising that to our listeners. If you don't already know there's more nuance, please go back and listen. And if you still don't, please leave. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so... I mean, okay, I feel personally very strongly about the problems with how we interact with scientific thought and scientific knowledge and scientific research. And the reason I feel so strongly about that, and I hate even saying that I feel so strongly about it, I think there's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that our interaction with science is very problematic. And if I can, if I can use an analogy, I mean, one of the, the, the best ones is, is the thing, one of my pet peeves at least, is that kind of clickbait science articles where you, you see things like, mm. scientists prove that red wine is good for you, for instance. That's a great <laughs> article. No, no, that's good. That's not clickbait. That's scientific. That's why, that's <laughs> yeah, why exactly. it's clickbait. It's because it agrees <laughs> with you. And, <laughs> and so there, there's tons of stuff like that, you know, where you'll, you'll see tons of headlines which say, scientists prove this, or scientists show that this is absolutely true. And it's, as I say, it's one of my pet peeves because that's just not how research works. And, uh, and I think it causes so many issues because what it does is it allows people to co-opt the authoritative nature of what science is supposed to be and use that, in the Sorry. Well, use that as evidence for agendas that they show that they have beyond furthering knowledge or developing solutions mm. to problems that we mm. face. Mm. And that's to me why it's an issue because people can selectively choose things and, and choose headlines and choose these kind of outcomes to push their agenda. And they don't even they don't even read it before they send it on to you. It's <laughs> yeah. just the headline. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you're gonna get into this, Rob, but to step all over your toes, um, science is not a headline, is a good place to start. Um, if half those people read the articles, they'd realize that there's a lot more nuance, even in the articles. Then if you go to the actual journal paper or the thesis or whatever, it's all based on, we know very little, we're trying to prove this one little, this one little um, point in this circle of knowledge yeah, exactly. that we have. And we're going to dive really deep into that. But I think you, you raise an interesting point, and that's people look at these, these kind of secondary sources. So, you know, some kind of uh, – some journalist picks up on, a, on an interesting uh, piece of scientific research that's been done, and they write a, a little, you know – 500 word, maybe less article, exactly. you know, sometimes it's like a little hundred word exactly. column. That's, exactly. That's a little fluff piece. Yeah. And you read this scientific research, which could be either a, a, a paper, which could be like 20 pages, or it could be like a, you know, whole research project, which is a couple of hundred pages. And it's condensed into, a, you know, a, a paragraph or two. And you're getting it as a secondary source, which is effectively a broken telephone. So you're not getting the whole picture. And, that is the stuff that gets quoted and requoted time and time again. I think that brings us nicely, quite nicely into biases. And I'd just like to like 
take take our listeners through a few biases that you um, that you might experience when you read said headlines. Um, <laughs> The one is my own creation, which is outrage bias, <laughs> which and I, I think that is an important thing to realize when you're clicking on these on, on these kinds of things. The reason the headline is the way it is, is often because it outrages you, because that gets you all the way into the, the website that is being advertised and obviously gets the website that is advertising to make it make its advertising re revenue. But in the official uh, version, uh, confirmation bias, giving more weight to evidence that supports our belief than not. Joe and his red wine example. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Proportionality bias, innate tendency to assume big events have big causes. And then projection bias. People who endorse certain theories are more likely to engage in such behaviors. For example, spreading rumors and fake news. So yeah. it's kind of a self-fulfilling little little cycle there. I would like to state that I had exactly those same quotes to, and statement to make. Great minds think alike. <laughs> we're, falling, we're falling into a bit of a rhythm here. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that leads into the next thing, which is, is quite important often with, with how people interact. And also when people start discussing these things is the, the concept of, of uh, uh, cognitive dissonance, mm. where people will, beyond their biases, when they read something which contradicts a belief that they already yes. hold, yeah. will try and deal with that in some way. And normally the thing that goes is the research. Yes, The evidence goes out the window, Definitely. the feelings stay behind. Yes, Can, can I jump yeah. in here? Go for it. So I'm doing a course on behavioral management and behavioral coaching. And one of the points that comes up, and I can't cite all the research behind it, except to know that the people teaching it to me have done, have compiled this course from global research. So it's a distillation of data. And they deal with the concept of an SOI, a structure of interpretation. And that's effectively how you see the world. And that's a, a very, very complicated mix of stuff from your childhood, your education, your beliefs, nurture, nature, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what, what's interesting is you cannot get someone to see something outside of their SOI. If you were to visualize mm. a human being looking in a direction and, and their vision is their SOI, it's what they can see. You cannot ask them to see something that's not in that vision. Mm. But what you can do is you can get them to change their SOI, to expand it, to alter it, to, to put that vision, either widen it or put it in a different perspective. Then they can see the thing. And cognitive dissonance speaks to that. They, there are some things you literally can't get because your head isn't there. Mm. Yeah, I think I think it talks to talks to self-assessment, and it it kind of talks to science as a field. And my my point earlier, where the acceptance is that you know very little, and chances are that you're probably wrong. Um, <laughs> and I think it's not necessarily a great way th to go through the world, but it is definitely the most effective way we have at gathering true information. I was just going to say, uh, I think the interesting thing about Joe's point is that the practical implication, which is that you don't tell first, you listen first. Oh, you listen, you yes. feel out that person's frame of reference, their kind of theory of change, their, yes. their kind of philosophy behind the interpretation, and then you decide how to... So, respond. Andrew, I mean, that, that's actually a great way to, to kind of move on to where, we, where we're going now. and. Uh, I do what I can. Not trying to blame people necessarily for not having an understanding of how, how science works, because I think if you if you haven't haven't studied something which has required you to do research, or you know, um, if you're not coming from a from a research background, or, or have had to at some point in your life conduct research which follows a very specific format, you might not really know the scientific method, and shouldn't have to know really. And I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit later about the problems in, in, in why people don't know these things and, and whether they should more extensively know. But if we, if we accept that, I mean, there's a large portion of the world that hasn't had scientific training or mm. research training, mm. uh, why would they know this method? And I think, you know, one of the th interesting things that, that comes out and, you know, the idea of a theory, for instance, um, that has a very different meaning when you're talking about research than when you're just talking colloquially. You know, it's uh, it's a very specific thing what it means, and maybe it's actually a good point to, to jump into that. I mean, when when people, you know, another one of my little pet peeves is when when people say, "Oh, but uh, evolution is just a theory," and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And when you're talking about scientific theory, 
I am, actually... I, I'm jumping in here. I'm going to interrupt <laughs> you. Because when people say that, I want to throw my fucking laptop in a lake. Outrage, evolution, science. evolution is a scientific fact. It is supported by the largest body of evidence we have ever accumulated. And every prediction it has ever made ha has been 100% correct. The reason why scientists say it is a theory stems from the field's acknowledgement that no one can ever really truly know anything for certain. As such, it's more an indication of the field's humbleness and its openness to critique and being wrong than its uncertainty in a matter. Well, Neil, I, I mean, I, I get you at outrage, and I think we, you know, the, it's very easy to feel that way, but I think it's, I'd like to frame it differently in that we use the word theory a lot. I mean, it's it's something, oh, guys, I have a theory on why it hasn't rained in, in three months. Or I have a theory on why when I drank 10 beers last night, I I, I fell off my bed and I have and, a, theory and have a on sore why head. red wine is good for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it doesn't mean anything in that context. But when you're talking about a theory in terms of scientific thought or scientific knowledge, it actually has a specific meaning. And, and I mean, one of, mean? One of the, the things that I kind of struck me in, and, and the kind of most complete and, and short uh, explanation that I, I saw was um, it's an explanation of the natural world that can be repeatedly tested and verified in accordance with the scientific method. So when we're talking about theories in terms of science or in terms of research and knowledge, that's what we specifically mean. And Let's I think- Let's just say that again for the listeners, apologies, that can be repeatedly tested. And verified in accordance with the scientific method. And we're <laughs> gonna talk a bit about the scientific method as well now. But, you know, I think, as I say, I'm, I'm not, I don't wanna, present it as an accusational thing like you don't know this but i think it's it's just one of those things where people we talk we use the word theory a lot and when we use it in a scientific context it means something different and i think that's just something important to recognize before you get into the scientific method um rob I, I, we, we're going to get there before you even get there more often than not the first thing you'll need to hand in for a journal paper thesis or the like is a literature review and in this already, there is critical assessment, uh, critical self-assessment and assessment of others built into the method. Some notable points here are the comparison of contrasting pieces of literature to each other and to your idea for your thesis paper or whatever, the listing of strengths and weaknesses of each piece of reviewed lit literature, and the analysis of what gaps exist in the literature you've reviewed. These are required in order to apply to do a piece of scientific research. I just, sorry, I just thought that. No, it's awesome, man. I mean, you, you've, you've kind of um, started off where I'm, where I'm gonna head here, so I'll just carry on from that. So sorry, dude. what you do when you, you're, you're conducting research is exactly that. You, you, you have an idea of a question you'd like to ask. So you start doing this literature review, you start asking or doing background research. What, what has been studied in this field? What are the questions that have been raised? What are the answers that we do have and how do those inform the question or change the question that I have? Once you've done that, you then construct a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is a very important thing. Again, I think, you know, you don't necessarily know if you haven't been involved in this kind of research, but one of the most important parts of scientific research and in constructing a hypothesis, and it's something I think we, we're going to keep coming back to in a lot of what we talk about today, is the idea of, of something or the question you're asking being falsifiable. And what does that mean? It means that there, there is a possible negative answer. And the reason that's important is because if you can come up with that, um, you, can, you, can, you have a better chance of proving something conclusively or disproving something conclusively. So an example for our listeners. There's no good hypothesizing that a giant white gorilla lives in the Michalisberg Mountains because there is no way to prove it wrong. All you will ever find is the absence of evidence, and thus the statement is non-falsifiable. The proper way to state the above-mentioned hypothesis, as ludicrous as it is, would be no white gorillas have ever lived in the Michalisberg Mountains. Usually something that's falsifiable, um, usually something is falsifiable when just one observation is required to disprove it. For example, the filming of said giant white gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, you know, not wanting to get too technical about this specific thing, I think you've, you've kind of <laughs> elegantly put it there with a white girl. Or too much more technical. But I think the great part about that and the, the gist of this is that a lot of what research is supposed to do 
is basically look for ways to make sure to to say like I'm wrong, you know. So you 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 look you you pose questions, and basically you want to be proven wrong because mm. then that gives you a conclusive answer. Exactly. exactly. And so you can rule out. Imagine it like a series of doors, and if you can if you can kind of prove that several of those doors have nothing behind them, then the you know left, the one yeah. that's left could go somewhere. And yeah. it's yeah, definitely. Um, just to uh, the the other two points on the on the hypothesis, I'm not going to get. I, I, I'm not sure whether you're going to get into it, but I'll just step all over your toes still because it uh, <laughs> seems to be the thing that I'm doing today. Um, it must be testable, which is pretty self-explanatory. You and others may, must be able to test your hypothesis. Thus, you can't hypothesize. It doesn't matter whether a giant white gorilla lives in the Michalisberg Mountains. <laughs> it doesn't matter in, in in air quotations. Doesn't have any specific meaning. The other point is that a hypothesis must be repeatable. Um, in other words, other people must be able to replicate your experiments and compare their results to yours. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it talks about it talks a lot about the scientific method. So as we kind of going through this, now that you've constructed your hypothesis, you, your next job is to then test your hypothesis with an experiment. So you formulate this experiment, you test whether that experiment is actually going to give you answers to your hypothesis. If not, then you have to kind of do some troubleshooting. If yes, then you, you, you take readings uh, or measurements or uh, accumulate data. Uh, you then analyze that data and attempt to draw conclusions from that. And from those, that analysis, you then either show that the results align with your hypothesis or they maybe partially align with your hypothesis or they disprove your hypothesis and then you communicate those results. And that produces the body of research. And one of the important things I think we should get into now is research n never gives you an absolute answer or very rarely gives you an absolute answer. So you're not gonna get the red wine is 100% good for you How all the time. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Breaking so, my heart here. <laughs> I think when we, when we talk about this process, the outcomes of that are important. So. What you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, this was the question we asked. This was the research we did. This was the evidence we found. This is how we interpreted those results. And this is the kind of conclusions that we have come to. But everything you've described is a lot lengthier and more intellectual and less sexy than the 500-word highlight that the journalist's <laughs> going to write. Exactly. Mm. And, I mean, I think it, it, it cuts to the, the heart of the matter, which is people tend to want conclusive answers mm. we want certainty and science is not offering that necessarily it's offering answers to specific questions under specific uh circumstances circumstances in a specific context um so in joe's life the way he lives and breathes and eats and drinks red <laughs> exactly. wine two three four five classes a night most nights of the week is really good for you but that might it's not really apply good to for him person. Boo, boo, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Don't stop believing, Joe. Don't stop. <laughs> Don't stop. We can't force you. Just believe, man. Believe. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think that's an important thing to consider, that it, it's not meant to be 100% conclusive. It's not meant to give us the answers to life and all that's in it. Uh, it's, it's meant to answer... The, we, we do research to answer specific questions to, as a building brick in a body of knowledge that we're trying to accumulate. And part of those knowledge blocks we then can use to develop uh, solutions to problems we have or to kind of lead us in interesting directions to ask other questions that we may not have thought of before. And that's the whole point. There's nothing, the body of knowledge that we've accumulated as, as, as humans is the thing that becomes conclusive. No one specific part of that is conclusive in and of itself. Your analogy, uh, put it beautifully, you know, science's point is really more closing open doors than opening closed doors. We, we try this, okay, did it work? No, it didn't. Next thing, try this, work, did it work? No, it didn't. So if that conclusivity is almost, it's unfair to expect that, even though it's given us rockets that go into outer space, even though it's given us the, the computing power of 10,000 humans in the palm of our hand, that is, it's not a thing that happens every day. And you never see the unsung heroes who spent their entire lives kind of closing a lot of doors, but not actually coming to the one open door. Um, 
Yeah. So I've, I've got two things. The, the one is... No, only one thing! Oh, yeah, that's, oh, that's, that's hard. That's hard. I've, I've not got to choose. <laughs> um, the, the one is that, and, and I'm not sure we can unpack it, but I mean, at some point you do get certainty. We know the size of the Earth. We know atoms make up our constitution. We know how to get rockets into space. The red wine thing is still in question. At least, <laughs> at least we know how to make red wine. So, so I just want to put that out there. I mean, it's not this eternal um, bog of uncertainty. And I think your metaphor works. You build blocks and the blocks accumulate to something. The second one for me is the more interesting one, really, which is the practicality of everything you've just discussed. Because the only people who are going to go that deep down that dark hole are the science community. The rest of us, 99 point something percent of the world, need to get on with it. And, and then I think the unlock is what you mentioned, which is this concept of certainty. We don't like uncertainty as a species. I, ironically, in this coaching program I'm doing, we're also learning about the human brain. The human brain finds wiring neural pathways that deal with uncertainty on a molecular level harder than dealing with absolutes. Mm. And thus it SOIs, it structures its interpretation accordingly. Mm. So, so can we go to that? Can we go to how we deal with the science and this knowledge? I think it's worth saying that what we're talking about here with the scientific method is itself disputed to a large extent. So a lot of people who have looked at the scientific method Curve and balls. kind of seen how... <laughs> Andrew, my brain can't deal with this level of uncertainty, dude. You need to give me a straight line here. Sorry, guys. This is no world for a human no. brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's another fucking episode, episode title. title. Right? <laughs> or a right? band name. Please, please continue. Yeah, I think, I think it's just, you know, a part of what you're saying, yeah, Hannes, is just kind of like computational efficiency. Your brain wants to be able to do the bare minimum that it needs to do as quickly as possible with as, as little energy as possible. And, uh, uh -huh. yeah, and, and it's, that it's, is scientific it's not fact, as concerned as with the truth as, yeah. as one might think we are. Yeah, we, we kind no, of, definitely not. you know, the brain likes beliefs that are simple because it conserves brain power, beliefs that make you feel good about yourself. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of other things that, uh, that could get you lying Andrew, to yourself. Andrew uh, raises a really interesting yeah. point in that, um, you know, for instance, the, the um, scientific a method is is not like it's not beyond uh, criticism itself, and I mean, for instance, one one things like falsifiable hypothesis. There, there's a lot of debate about whether that actually, you know, is is valid anymore. In a lot of the kind of, I mean, when they, for instance, researching string theory, that will never be falsifiable. Indeed, um, and that's the whole point of it. And so there there is a lot of debate. But what I think the point is that doesn't undermine necessarily the quality of research that has happened under those procedures. And I think that's the important thing that, you know, what quite often happens is people will jump onto debate around these things and use that to undermine evidence. And I think it's important to note that even though there might be debate around this process, it doesn't necessarily undermine the, the, valid, the validity of research that has happened. I suppose the other grenade to throw into the steaming pot of idea generation is that there's also data. So I'm, I'm thinking in my field at the moment, I'm, I'm thinking of stuff like what is the uh, GDP of a country now versus what it was? What is the wealth of individuals in a country now versus what it was? And that's, that's mm. not a scientific thesis you're unpacking, that's data. Well, there's a Stephen Fry argument for that, like why science works. Well, look, the airplane stays in the air, yes. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so there's also that element, and I don't know what to do with that. That's why it's a grenade in the thinking part. <laughs> well, I think it leads us interestingly into talking about bad research. And I think it's important that we do discuss this because at the end of the day, people who are conducting this research mostly are humans. Sometimes you have their own SOI before, structures of yeah, interpretation so, who have their own biases. But they're also Rob, so, yeah. Rob, Rob you, uh, just before you start talking about research, I have a little clip for us that I'd like to play. A little tidbit. It's very, it's very nice. I think you guys will like it. Well, hello there, everyone. I hope you're having an amazing day. I just wanted to come in front of you all and share something, as I usually love to do. I made a video some time back, and I, um, I don't know, oh, there you are, okay. I made a video back a while ago sharing 
what I had found when I wrapped my phone in tinfoil um, due to EMF poisoning from our phones and my research. So let me let me just stop that there. I'm sure we've uh, I'm sure we've all basically um, uh, heard a heard a, a similar thing before, um, and it's. It's amazing because I think I think we should actually institute a little thing here because we're all culprits of this as well. You know, talk coming onto the show and saying talking about research. Well, is it really research in the in the scientific sense of the word? Um, is what this lady does research? And I think what I what I'm going to institute is a bottle cap throw. So if you say research on this show, and I know Rob, you're very careful. You say I looked at when I was looking into this or something like that. I am culprit number one. But if anyone says research, Andrew will make sure our bottle caps get to you by courier, my friend. <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> Is this research? Yeah, how much research did you do? <laughs> So um, I, I must just give a plug and credit to the place where I got this video. Uh, the YouTuber's name is Sai, as in science, man, Dan, all one word. He is a brilliant science educator and debunker. He never gets angry or patronizing or humiliating with people he's debunking and deals with everything in a standard British no-fuss kind of way. Uh, but, more <laughs> but more on that later. Um, I read an article which provides a pretty useful list of ways in which to spot bad research. Aha. It's a pretty long list, but here they are, and we're going to go through this. So I'm going to go again. So I'm going to go through it quickly. Is the research peer reviewed? Is it published in a top tier academic journal? And here, the clever people at Journal Citation Report Database have created an impact factor where the scores range from zero for no impact to over a hundred for lots of impact. Do other scholars trust this work? Who funded the research? What are the author's credentials? How old is the study? Do the authors have a conflict of interest? What's the sample size? Does the study rely on survey results? Can you follow the methodology? Is statistical data uh, presented? Are the study findings supported by the data? And is it a meta-study? And a meta-study, for those of who don't know, is a, a conglomeration of studies that, that pool data from many different studies that are available online. So here, I'd like to make an example um, while I dance all over Rob's toes and follow it through this list. I think by now you've picked Rob up and no, you're I, swinging I, over I, the dance floor and he's just... I, I hope cool, man. I got my steel, my, my steel toe cap boots, so <laughs> I, I'm all good. You're going to kick me in the crotch when you get sick of me, hey? Huh? Very nice. <laughs> I'm a gentleman, Neil. <laughs> so it'll be a knee. I'll Not kick you in the shin. <laughs> Um, 5G BioShield is a product that popped up after David Icke's deplatforming comment made earlier this year that 5G causes coronavirus. The site reads, 5G BioShield contains proprietary quantum nano layer full spectrum protection, Rob. Wow, sounds promising. Sure. So like what would you pay Three for condoms over your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and it sells for the low, low price of only 283 great British pounds. Or change. 799 for three. That's a bargain. It's cheaper to just knock down the, the 5G towers, man. <laughs> <laughs> on the website, they draw these beautiful little bubbles around people who are sitting with their laptops in, on grassy knolls and like ar around your entire house even. This is amazing. From the first line on the, on the, on the website, through a process of quantum oscillation, the 5G BioShield USB key balances and reharmonizes the disturbing frequencies arising from the electric fog induced by devices such as laptops, cordless phones, Wi-Fi, and tablets. And I Donald wonder, Trump. I, I wonder why the first person on your, the first picture is a bubble around a person using a laptop, but never mind. It restores the coherence of the geometry of atoms, which allows a perfect induction for life forces, Andrew, by recreating a cardiac coherence <laughs> via plasmic support and interactivity. <laughs> This product, the product emits a large number of life force frequencies, favoring a general revitalization of the body, adjusting them according to the absorption capacity of each respective individual. Under the How It Works section of the website... Sorry, can I just say that there is a copywriter out there who deserves an Academy Award? Or <laughs> I, think, I think he I mean, just... That was... I'm sold. I want 10 of these things. I want my life force to be re I don't know. It sounds like he described like the most perfect bowel movement. <laughs> 
we, we clearly, I was picturing a, a glass of wine um, in a hammock on a beach, maybe with a good looking blonde. <laughs> but, you know, whatever floats your boat. Under the How It Works section of the website, this is the first line. In our civilization is emerging a new science based on knowledge, whereas the official, in brackets, old science is based on information. We get information through our senses, senses, which are dual and deliver us an inverted picture of the truth and consequently, information is the opposite of knowledge, so that all old scientific concepts are therefore the opposite of true concepts. One can find the true concepts in my recent publications. Word salad of the highest order, to quote <laughs> Simon Dan Touché. again. <laughs> so, they have don't trust your senses. <laughs> are you even reading this website? <laughs> <laughs> you think you are. <laughs> so, I love how he, he's effectively saying, don't believe anything you've read, but read my book. Yes, except read this. my papers. Yeah, yeah. except this is your reading right. I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a long arc. We are coming back, but at least guys are enjoying so it. <laughs> So, they have some publications. Amazing. Let's have a look, Andrew. Hmm. The International Journal of Science Research. Sounds official. It does. But is it? Wow. The abstract, as in the first line of the first paragraph on the first paper that this guy puts on his site, reads as follows. The true aton, as in A-T-O-N, concept of the cell, atom, and particle has been experimentally proven, and the following main conclusions have been drawn. In the center of every cell, atom, and particle, there is a still point of zero electrical potential, hmm. which is the still zero point of the universal mind, Rob, <laughs> with a capital M, and which is the source of energy. Each cell, atom, God, and particle consists dead. of light rings spinning around the centering mind point, again with a capital M. Science is spiritual, since spirit is centering every piece of matter. Crystals, Again, bro. the scriptwriter, like needs an award. He carries on to rubbish laws that have perfectly predicted the flow of electrons for decades by saying, and I quote, the Coulomb law statement that opposites attract and, attract and likes repel, and the next section is all in capitals like an angry school child or a mother who doesn't know how to type on her new phone, is not true to natural law. And to respond in kind... Like Abdul. <laughs> <laughs> and to respond in kind if it's if it's not true to natural law how does your usb stick transfer energy doctor so as if this wasn't enough he even takes on newtonian physics in saying that there are physical principles in large things that do not apply to orbital mechanics hmm he carries on to state matter-of-factly that since the creator is all there is, caps again, the material universe is the product of thinking as a mental activity and must be made of pairs which void each other because they cannot exist. Okay, the actual fuck. So let's get back to the list. Is the research peer-reviewed? Well, despite the International Journal of Science Research claiming it is peer-reviewed, I could find no evidence of this. Also, it is worth mentioning that not all peer review is created equal. Is it published in a top-tier academic journal? Despite the allusion to the contra contrary, no, it's not. Oh, the not International Science Journal isn't a top-tier journal? So, oh, I'm disappointed. <laughs> so not one of the tools that I was speaking about earlier that I put this International Science Journal's ISDN code into even returned a, 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 a match. So, and then when I, when I searched the words, the same thing. So that is that. Do other scholars trust this work? Well, not that I can see, and believe me, I looked. Not one citation, as far as I, as far as I can tell on the whole of the internet. Who funded the research? Well, it was the same guy conducting it, one Dr. Lakachevic. What are the author's credentials? He's apparently a doctor of quantum physics, so there is that. But the science mentions that he was a resident professor at the Max Planck Institute, a very famous institute. Um, when this news broke, though, the institute came out and said that he had once given a guest lecture there, and it was for a privately organized event that was just held at the institute. How <laughs> 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 <Bom, it's> for <laughs> Man, by that reasoning, I could say, like, I played in Radiohead, because I once saw them play live. <laughs> I mean, you were in, I the, was in Radiohead. You were in the audience that contributed to that live show. Right? I am oh, actually Tom York. Surprised. In case you guys didn't know, my, I am actually Tom York. <laughs> I just got my eye fixed. <laughs> <laughs> 
How old is the study? It's 0.6, okay, 2019. Some of this is dry, so bear with me. Do the authors have a conflict of interest? Yes, the worst kind. They benefit directly from their research by convincing people they need bioshields and then selling them. But I want to harmonize my life energy. <laughs> no, shut up, Joe. I've had enough of you. <laughs> <laughs> what is the sample size? Not applicable. Does the study rely on survey results? No. Can you follow the methodology? Well, the approach and results section starts with, it is logical to assume that there must be a red thread, whatever that means, connecting all these phenomena. Something secret and not yet known. Something that is crucially different from everything that scientific explanations of these phenomena could offer. I've started a search in order to discover the truth about it by studying Walter Russell, and there are citations, as well as Phoenix journals, where it is claimed that the cell, atom, and particle are made of light rings spinning around a black hole. Could you follow that, Rob? Okay. Is statistical data presented? No. Are the study findings supported by the data? Not applicable. Is it a meta study? No. So you can see it's not just one category that this research in huge air quotations fails on, it is many. And just as a side, I've seen everyone from engineers to scientists debunk this. This is just a USB stick with an LED and a holographic etched pattern in the actual stick part of it. One of the people debunking it found the actual company that produces the exact sticks online in under a minute. You could choose your own design for them to like 3D etch into, like, in, into the stick. And just finally, as my own point, read critically. Scientists don't often infer God, the universe, mind with a capital M or any other such philosophical or theological concepts when writing papers. In fact, they actually actively avoid such things. Another dead giveaway is the use of words like searching for the truth. Scientists don't have to mention that. They spend their entire lives doing that. All of science is the pursuit of truth. I am finished. I got through all of it. Yo, that's that's intense stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> so sorry, I, Rob. <laughs> no, no, Neil, that, that's great. But I think, you know, for for the average Joe, I mean, for instance, when you're at a dinner party and someone says to you, bro, I just got my uh, USB stick thing that's like stopping 5G, my life bro. life harmonizer. Life harmonizer, yussie. And, uh, and, I mean, it's not really feasible to all of the time when you're confronted with bad science like that to, to go and, you know, through it a nine step process or seven step process, whatever you say. Yeah. And 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 check, you know, check the source, check is the author um, credible, is the, the paper credible, is the journal credible. Um, so one of the other things I found was a nice little take with you lunchbox version of, of this. And I think this this is something that that people should kind of incorporate into a lot of the discussions they have at, you know, for instance, dinner parties or whatever, when mm. people bring up things that sound suspect like this to you. The first one is, what is your evidence? And it's a simple question. So, <laughs> you know, okay, I'm, I'm buying this thing to cut out 5G rays or whatever it is. You're like, well, what is your evidence that this thing is going to do that? Oh, well, the website gives you a whole bunch of information. You're like, okay, cool. So that's the source of your, your evidence. So that's the next question. What is the source of the evidence that you have? Okay, well, it's... It's the website, the, the guys website. that are selling, as you said, the same guys that are trying to sell the product to you. Okay, so is there any independent verification of this? And that's quite a simple thing to do. You know, just through a little Google search, you can see if there's any other things to, to kind of independently verify this kind of stuff. And that doesn't mean the that... International <laughs> Journal of Science and <laughs> the other one? Phoenix Journals. It's all backed up, man. It's backed up. Okay, yeah, so, it, it so then even if, you, the even if you said that, okay, then, then your, your final question is, what is the reasoning that links your evidence back to the claim? And you went through a whole bunch of really crazy convoluted stuff on like the mind as like the the god particle, <laughs> yeah, the and universal. all of that kind of stuff. And I think a good rule of thumb is, you know, one of one of the, the the I think it's something that gets credited to Einstein is if you can't explain a concept to I think it's like you know to your grandmother, for instance. I think that's how the saying goes. You don't actually understand it. And if someone says to you, oh, you know, it's about the mind and it's about the God particle and it's about this and all this like crazy convoluted stuff, which doesn't make any sense. And they can't actually explain to you a clear link between what this thing that they have and the thing that it's trying to do is, then it's nonsense. When interrogating, what are all the things that you just mentioned? Not. They are not telling the person they're wrong. They are questions, they are asking. And that's the only thing I'd underline, is mm -hmm. when you wanna 
get someone else to see maybe flaws in their argument or their reasoning. When you want to fact check something, you don't tell the person until it goes through their thick skull, even though that's what many, especially South African dinner parties and brides devolve into. People telling each other things in the hope of changing a mind. Mm -hmm. I'm you sorry, ask, auntie. <laughs> <laughs> you ask a simple open-ended question. And then the other person must build the logical argument to you. And when they fail and trip themselves up in their own idiocy, they will hang themselves and realize they've got to change their mind. But also, Joe, you know, just going back to the dinner party thing and to what I, the quotes I said uh, that I brought up last week, you can't deal with the intolerant in a tolerant way. In as much as I feel, and we're going to get into it, science is a bad communicator, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I obviously agree completely with what you're saying, but it depends who you have around your dinner table. So, so I'm going to come back on that. I mean, we're on the same page. Huh? <laughs> um, if the person on the other end is not able to deal with being questioned, then you're not going to, then there's no point talking to them about yeah, this you know, anyway. You know already you're from the start. So, yeah. so, so often the person at the other end of the table the, the two are going to spend the whole night arguing in yes. an attempt to win the other, when, when it is obvious that neither will move. Yes. So then just stop wasting your time and, frankly, mine. I'd like to enjoy my red wine and, and, and your bride. <laughs> and my bride. <laughs> so I'd like to just put a little counterpoint to this now, and, and that is that science is not beyond reproach, or scientists are not mm. beyond reproach. Mm. They are humans too and, as such, are fallible. And there has, throughout history, been a lot of times and a lot of situations, and there's a lot of research, bad research that's been put out by, you know, respected scientists. And I mean, some of the the examples that you can go back to, some of the famous ones, which people like to to talk about, is how you know, like, for instance, I mean, Newton, like the ultimate bad guy of science, mm. how he suppressed so much stuff and and refused to, and how he controlled mm. the scientific community to mm. not kind of go against him in a lot of ways. Einstein did that too. Yeah, so, I mean, there's been a lot of these kinds of things. Scientists are fallible, um, mm. and no one should ever fall into... We spoke about the cult of personality earlier. Them themselves should not be the people that you, you listen to. You should look at the research. But the and the idea. research should be... Sorry, you know, I just want to finish mm. this no, thought. No. And the research should be, again, verifiable. So when they put out research, you can then look at counterpoints to that or arguments against that research or if it's been independently verified. Uh, just as a kind of half rebuttal to that, yes, scientists are fallible, but the idea behind the scientific method, and I'm sure Andrew's going to shoot me down, but it is as it takes almost takes the idea is to take the person out of the research, you know, that that is the idea, so that the the structure of your information is as airtight as it could possibly be, and those people admit that they're wrong all the time. They think they've figured something out, then they find something else, and they're like, well, under these conditions, that doesn't actually hold up, you know? And that's that's the case for most of science. Yeah. Moving along. It's funny that that's even worth mentioning, actually, because you almost kind of, in a way, it should go without saying that, like, if if I'm wrong, I want to know about it. Mm. But science uh, it's so kind of anti anti human nature, you know? It seems like most people almost presume they are the the opposite. They don't want to know about it if they're wrong. Exactly. But but that's what we're getting at is that science involves testing. It involves verifying a th hypothesis. And the ability for other people to independently yes, verify, verify that same and information. Test. And that, to, to bring it together again, that it is through other people verifying, testing, disproving, proving mm. that you build those building blocks of knowledge Exactly. That eventually allow a rocket because, to go Because just to drive it all the way home, me putting up a hypothesis and a paper out is not one of those blocks that you were talking about, you know? That only becomes a block when Johannes, Sois, and Rob have tested that, mm -hmm. all found exactly mm -hmm. the same results, and then we go, well, we, we all agree. Or, or and found then, the opposite, in which case it's still a block because you've closed that door. Y yes, but, but other people would also have to find, find the opposite, yes. And an example of why this is important is, for instance, uh, when people make arguments uh, in, in, for anti-vax, for instance, the anti-vaxxers arguments are always revolve around a piece of research, supposedly, which linked uh, vaccinations to autism. Mm. You guys are giving and, me a tough night. Eh? First the Republicans, <laughs> now anti-vaxxers. Oh, and, no. and I mean, one of the interesting things about that is that, yes, it a lot of these arguments are based on one piece of research, 
but that research has never been independently verified exactly. ever. And that undermines that research. And, you know, so I, what I'm trying to bring out is it's very easy for people to say, oh, well, there's been research done in this. Look, it's in scientific. It's followed the scientific method. But if it's not independently verified, as Neil said, it, it doesn't form that the brick in that body of knowledge that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. And I th just an another few things um, that I, that I want to me mention under bad research is um, the m misrepresentation of actual facts. And my example a few weeks ago of an actual doctor, Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma, standing up in court and saying that 50, over 50% 50 of smokers who contract COVID-19 die from a sample size of 11 men in China <laughs> is deliberately misleading you. And that's another kind of like subheading so under, it uses under a bad fact, research. But it doesn't give you it an uses a, it's actual research. That's real research that was conducted properly, but she took one part of a thing that actually had nothing to do with it, and then stood up in court with a straight face and said that. And she was a research assistant for, I think, 10 years at Oxford. I'm worried and about I Neil's outrage bias. We should, we should gently <laughs> well, scope this Huge that, that, outrage that, that, bias. That, that, <laughs> huge. There's one final point in, in the, on this specific topic that I'd like to bring up, and you, you kind of raised it, Neil, in that that kind of evidence is also, I think, one of the, the most common misunderstandings and one of the most common misuses of scientific research in misrepresenting causation versus correlation. Mm. And that's exactly an example of that. And I mean, it's something I think people really need to be aware of. It's fine to say like, okay, there's there's a correlation between these two things and you can take your own inferences from so that. Give that will to you, us uh, for two minutes for yeah, the listeners. Yeah, hold on. Will you, sorry, will you unpack it? Okay, what? so for instance, in Neil's example, there was research, however limited it was, which showed that there was a a, a, a correlation between a certain group of people who were smokers and them dying of COVID-19. They didn't prove that those people died because they were smokers. But you can draw inferences from that correlation, but it doesn't mean that it proves that if you are a smoker, you will die. Okay, maybe, you know, you, it all depends on the what the application of the information you're using. For instance, if you're forming health policy, sometimes it's okay to say, like, you know, if, we, if we're looking at a correlation, it's enough, enough to formulate yeah. our health policy around that yeah. because the downside to not doing it is but great. But that's and policy, the, that's not science. But, exactly. you must, but you must also, you must realize the difference between those things exactly. because mm. it's a very, very mm. important point that kind of gets hammered so into. So everyone who lives around the 5G tower, uh, three out of one out of every three people who live around the 5G tower are dying. Yeah, and and now you would like to say that that is the cause of the tower, but you yeah. don't have all the evidence and actually there's like a hypothetical axe murderer going around murdering them in their beds. And the other two people that live around that same 5G tower are old ladies of 70 years old taking out their rifles and shooting at the people <laughs> on the fucking tower. Shooting at the tower, yes. <laughs> no, people on the tower, dude. It's not even like trying to blow up the tower. There's some like arbitrary guy who's like a, an electrician and he works, works for Vodafone. And this old lady whips out her rifle. take him out and, like she, Liam Neeson in <laughs> Taken. Her last mission in life to save us from the British Telecom's technician. <laughs> so on that violent note, I'd like to throw the ball over to you, Neil, and, and talk a little bit about how just, the scientific community and how science in general react, uh, interacts with us. Just one last thing that I want to say, sorry, under, under bad research is eyewitness testimony. And uh, Carl Sagan makes this point really well in his book, and I'm going to get into that later. But eyewitness tes testimony in a court of law is the highest form of e evidence. In science, with great reason, eyewitness testimony is worth less than writing a single line on a piece of paper. And that is really important for people to realize. Because of our fallibility as human beings, you telling me that you saw this experiment work is not enough for me to believe you in a scientific con context. And I just, sorry, that was my last yeah, thing. Yeah, look, I've got a lot to say about that and whether I should say it now, but I, I mean, it's interesting because how often we, we rely, for instance, as you're saying in a court of law, and it, it struck me today, you know, in the evidence uh, at the Zonda Commission, you know, a lot of the stuff that's, that's being aired, and I mean, it was the same with the, the, the arms deal um, inquiry, mm. You know, they're asking people about things which happened up to a decade ago, sometimes more. Yeah. And I mean, there's a, there's an idea 
well, there's 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 a theory, <laughs> and I, I forget the the name of it, but I think it's called something like the you know big event, um, something oh, to do with yes, big events. But yes, yes, the yes. the idea basically is that they've done research into very big human events, like for instance things like nine eleven is one of the, the common ones, and they've asked people, for instance. What do you remember about that day? And very specific things like where mm. were you? What were you wearing? Mm. What happened? What happened in your day on that day? And then they ask him twelve months later, and their memory of that changes, and exactly. successively it changes dramatically. But the interesting part is how convinced people are of their current memory. Yes. So they have a, a very yes. much a recency bias to what they feel now. So Even they'll go and you'll you can present them. Yeah, you can present them with the thing that a year ago you told us this is what was happening and they'll say no it wasn't i don't know why i said that but it wasn't that it was this <laughs> yes yeah and so our memories are so unreliable exactly and exactly. yet we we do rely we on them so fact. much yeah we, we take it for fact take it for fact and and just just to jump in here and i'm sure andrew knows a lot about this point um, in the kind of 1960s, 1950s there was this whole thing about repressed memories in um, in the us and and <laughs> psychologists proved that 90 percent i'm blowing that out of proportion of children were molested in in that childhood in, were, were molested in childhood and they did this by hypnosis and they and they brought this out of these children and actually what we've proved after the fact is that all of that was due to suggestion like just the suggestion of it in in a kind of it, it doesn't even need to be a young mind any mind causes you to question your own memories um, and whether you realize that pr process or, or not is a different story but it just shows that infallibility uh, uh, th that fallibility of of memories yeah totally um, <clears throat> if people don't realize how fallible they are and how like um, memories are almost sort of constructed and there are all kinds of incentives that that go into that um, for example, they're kind of social mechanisms that play a role. For ex so, if if you know that um, if you've just witnessed some some big event and another witness says, "Oh, did you see X, Y, and Z?" and you actually didn't, you'll start to think, "Oh, you know, uh, I did. actually, I think that did. I think that did cross my mind." Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, but I'd, I'd I'd actually forgotten about that. Stuff like that, where you start to um, it's very you fluid the, actually the memory based on things other than that experience itself. It's very yeah. fluid as opposed to rigid memory, and the, uh, people do, from the inside you don't experience your memories. They say like that, that none of us have memories um, up until the age of three or four, and that if you think you have memories before then, you have completely constructed those memories. Perhaps we must look at our memories with the same critical eye that we should at scientific statements. Well, yeah. If you read Carl Sagan's The Demon Haunted World, you will start looking at your memories like that. But that brings us, um, to circle back to 10 minutes ago, <laughs> to how <laughs> science interacts with us. And I think it's easy to say that, that a lot of the fault rests on people and how they deal with science. But actually, science is a bit of a bastard. Um, it communicates badly, authoritatively. Um, and By science, you mean the scientific community? The science, science is a field, the, the scientific community. Um, and people don't like being told what to do. They actually want to know that someone is listening, to your point around the dinner table, um, that they have care for their concerns, and, th and they want to feel like they belong. And the problem is that snake oil salesmen all over the world have already created this community that the scientific community have kind of cast aside. Um, I think that point can't be underscored enough. I don't people make, that point. People Sorry. make decisions based on emotions. And the scientific community is not, is not a, a mechanism for communicating effectively to people who have, hold very strong beliefs, people who want to belong, people who don't want to be told what to do. Um, because in as, in as little as they are kind of certain about things, they are very certain about their uncertainty, you, if, if that makes any sense. Can I throw in a quote there? So one of the articles you guys sent us was from The Guardian um, by a recognized scientific gentleman, and he said, how many science communicators do you know who will take the time to listen to their audience? 
and I'll interject here, they haven't talked yet. They haven't tried to put something into the person's head. They're just listening. Then, who are willing to step outside their cozy little bubble mm. and make an effort, because it is an effort, to reach people where they are, where they are confused. I like that. I like that. So a couple of cool things. Um, I, uh, I heard about this guy, uh, this quantum physicist, who lent out, he, he essentially sold his time, um, his lunch hour at the university for $50 an hour for anyone to come and speak to him about, uh, I suppose, science in general, as well as quantum physics, as well as, but he got a hell of a lot of response from people who had very alternative kind of views, you know, why don't ghosts exist? Why? And, and that's a really cool idea, I think. I mean, this guy, he probably works like 10, 12 hours every day <laughs> researching, and he's selling his one hour in the middle of the day for $50. I mean, to, I like but two, two, two hot dogs or whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, two hot dogs and two coffees for the conversation, I suppose. <laughs> um, and I, I really like that idea because, like you said, that is a person that is coming from such a – this guy's a professor – so such a high level and willing to engage with people. And I, I think that's a huge part of the problem of the scientific um, community. Another problem with the scientific community is the kind of smackdown and debunking videos. There's a hell of a lot of negativity around a lot of those videos. And actually, you can see kind of people who are the difference between people who are outraged by kind of the resurgence of the flat earth or whatever and and those people and the people who have actually thought about this stuff like we're thinking about it now and i'll mention simon down again because he deals with the most outlandish claims ever and he never he never ever belittles someone it's it's still interesting to see people make ludicrous claims and him in a very british kind of very very colloquial almost way disproving it on a scientific, um, in a scientific manner. And you can see that that's a person that's actually thought about their role kind of in society. The fact that they obviously have to, they feel they have to do something about the, the fact that the, the, there's this resurgence of stuff. Um, but then taking that tact when it's so easy to ridicule, and I think that's worth mentioning. Yeah, it ties back to something we said in one of our first episodes, uh, which was, you know, in this, in this thing, do you want to be right? Or do you want things to be better? Conversations for understanding as opposed to conversations to win. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Love it. And guys. that's what Love goes it. wrong at the dinner table. And Love that, it. listeners, is one of the things we really are trying to show you as an audience. We want to add some value. Add some value that way. Have a conversation to understand. Listen. Go to where the other person is. Even if they're wrong and their head's up their ass, Spend 10 minutes there with them. If they head's still up, they're asked maybe. maybe <laughs> but go, go and enjoy your ribs. Go and enjoy your ribs in your glass of cover day seven. Yeah. But then, like, yeah, so, so like I've said, you have Simon Dan, and he follows in quite a long lineage of people who have decided to dedicate their lives to educating the public at large about science. Um, and this was started by um, Carl Sagan, in, as, as far as I can tell, with the popularization of um, co the Cosmos TV series and bringing that kind of content onto TV was unheard of in the 70s, I hope I'm right, 70s, 80s. Um, it was unheard of. People, the, the subject matter was too dry, you know? But Carl Sagan had this natural wonder and this natural way to explain things that make, that entertain people, that interest them. And he didn't need to tell them about all the like nitty gritty and the dynamics or anything like that. He told them the massive points and that actually caused a huge amount of people to go back into the scientific community, which was kind of dwindling around that time. So, and then in his footsteps, you had Neil deGrasse Tyson and Brian Cox. Um, Brian Cox did a, did a show where he sold out stadiums. He had the biggest um, LED screen the world has ever seen to present his, um, his kind of version of, or present his show on astrophysics. Um, and then Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, I don't know, man. It sounds like a, a stadium full of mind control to me. <laughs> <laughs> it probably is. Prove right? me wrong. He's a good-looking man. He's who's, a good-looking man. Who's your I, don't, source I, don't, for that? I think that's probably had a lot to do with it. I know he's got a lot of female female science fans. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, 
Um, but these people dedicated their lives to science education and it kind of like caused uh, Carl Sagan and these people after them caused a revolution in how they communicate mm-hmm. with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and even Richard Dawkins couldn't fuck it up. <laughs> I mean, no, people people fucking hated Richard Dawkins, man. And I don't know if that's the way to fucking communicate. He's with the people. worst. He's the worst. Sir Talking Andrew's about you, yes. I mean, a, a, both a Christian and atheist philosophers said, like, you don't go straight to the publisher. You talk crap about <laughs> philosophy of religion here. You should have tried to publish that in a philosophical journal and had us peer <laughs> review it and respond to it. And then you'd have known not to write your stupid book. Well, yeah. you, then you can't sell a New York Times multi-million dollar bestseller and become a millionaire. I mean, then you've got to be an academic. That's just less sexy. So there was well, an I mean, int- you can wrap tinfoil around your phone and do the same thing. I suppose. So long as it sounds I, like I it's did my sell. research, Andrew. I did my research. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a great there's sounds a great like documentary that. on Netflix about flat earthers um, mm-hmm. and beyond uh, the curve. For beyond the curve, of, yeah. And I think we'll talk more about the flat flat earthers a little bit later but there's a great part in it where there's, there's a meetup of people from the scientific community and one of the guys stands up to make the point that people who believe in in the flat earth um, idea or ideology are not stupid people that they're inquisitive people that have just kind of gone down the wrong path yeah, almost gone astray. Yeah. and the way that he really kind of brings it home which which resonated with me was that these are people which could contribute to the scientific community, could mm. contribute to the world. Mm. And instead, they're being more marginalized by people ridiculing them. And it's hard not to. I understand that I do it all the time and I feel bad about it now. Mm. But realizing that that is a loss. You know, if there are inquisitive people out there, that's an amazing thing. We need more people to be more inquisitive about the world. Mm. It's just we need to be more careful about how we we interact with these people not to drive them further down those paths of like extremist crazy thoughts. Mm. Mm. And yeah, just to, to my final few uh, points on, on how science interacts with us. There's a, there's been a suggestion that trying to deal with conspiracy thinking using logic and evidence can backfire. They actually call it the backfire effect. But when people re- uh, researched this, um, they, the research actually suggests that actual research, not bottle cap research, <laughs> the actual research suggests that this is this effect is much smaller than initially thought. So even if you don't hear out the person at your dinner table and you tell him these are the facts, more often than not, those people are not really going to try and double down on you. Um, so that's a, a little interesting piece of I would suggest that when people double down, they're not doubling down because you're presenting them with ideas. It's because you're challenging them. And if yes, you present that, that, that challenge in a way that, that isn't like causing an, an affront to them, yes. you, I, you stand a much better chance of yeah. success. And, and to, to word that um, slightly differently, um, to quote Stephen Lewandowski, Finding ways to counter, he talks about conspiracy theories, but let, let's call it unscientific thinking, without challenging a person's identity is therefore the effective strategy. Yeah. So, so try and have that conversation so that you separate the idea from the person's... This is a, this is a huge thing that I feel very strongly about. Because when it's because I'm people, right or wrong, yes. I can't, I've got to double down and because otherwise I lose face. But it also talks to ad hominem attacks, you know, and people feeling personal attacks about their ideas but the point is that people are married to their fucking ideas well, and you a- shouldn't be you should never be married to your ideas or your beliefs never and and I, I agree but i would also add that there is a way to interrogate it so that you don't push that marriage in sure there sure is a way to but there's also the a w- there's a separate the idea from the person definitely but there's also a way to conduct yourself as the person on the other side no, of course. in in saying whatever I said before. <laughs> uh, um, in, uh, what were you saying, Joe? Well, we, we're, we're just saying separate one's idea oh, from oh, one's idea. Yes, there's a, way, there's a way in, in which you, as the protagonist, conduct yourself in which you listen to ideas, they come into your head. When you discuss them with people, you remove yourself from that, that idea. You say, here is an idea. Mm. It's not my idea. Well, it usually, actually, literally isn't your idea. But don't don't marry yourself to your ideas or your beliefs. So I agree with you, but I would also put on the table that 
we're, we're expecting a level of maturity from humanity that we very seldom show. Yeah. And on many of the dinner table conversations, the more emotive it becomes, the less mature we are, and That's the more it's about our You're identity. a poopy head. <laughs> That's actually the reason why we started this podcast. Yeah. No one else wanted to, dis to discuss politics <laughs> with me. They all said, no, politics, we're not talking about this again. And I was like, well, <laughs> fucking, what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. You stop um, getting invited to dinner parties. That's the fucking issue. It's okay, I like to go to bed at 7.30, so dinner parties are... <laughs> Rob's, an, Rob's an early riser. <laughs> So uh, just two last points. Um, there was a study by Swami in 2014 that showed that even the suggestion of words like rational and analyze affected people's acceptance of conspiratorial thought. So even if they held this conspiracy, in fact, the entire study was about people that holding conspiratorial thought. And even the suggestion of words like rational and analyze, and he suggested it in a way in which it had nothing to do with the subject matter. He just kind of put it into the questionnaire in some, into some of those like... Primed things. Yes, yeah. It. Yeah, but like in a way that's not like ra rationalize and analyze your thoughts. Mm. It was a question that had nothing to do with that. And even then, the, the, um, the sample study that were given that question versus the sample study who weren't, and all of them held conspiratorial beliefs, those people were much less likely to feel kind of conviction in their, in their conspiratorial beliefs. Um, and then finally, uh, d just to bring up the point about intolerance and, and dealing with it with tolerance. If Donald Trump is at your dinner table. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do. You, you must actually just tolerate him. You, yeah, you must just actually tell him that he's wrong and move on. What I would suggest, okay, not that Donald Trump's going to be at your dinner table, but in a figurative sense, but if you've got, imagine are, we could Rob. get him on so, the show. Eh? <laughs> imagine we could get him on the show. <laughs> so, so, what? okay. What, I, what I'm liking, what I'm suggesting is if you have someone at the table with that kind of personality, that very kind of outlandish, because what happens in, in a situation like that, people who are very convinced and very convicted in their beliefs or in, their, in what they, they talk about tend to get followers. That's just how it works. Hmm. And what I would suggest, you're not arguing with him. So when you have in that situation, you've got the person, you're not arguing with that guy. He's going to stick with his ideas. You're never going to change his mind. But you've got... X many other people at that table, you're arguing to, with them. You're, you're trying to get them to not benefit. adopt his ideas and rather yes. adopt an approach to looking at his ideas oh, more. Rob, why? Mm. Why? <laughs> now I've got to work at the dinner table so I can save other people from Donald Trumpian idiocy. Do you I want to be right to or do you want ribs? things be, to be better? Isn't, uh, isn't I, that what you're doing here, Joe? <laughs> oh, here I'm talking to my friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I'm suggesting, if you're going to get into that argument, don't think about the argument being with him. Think no, about I, the I, argument. I totally hear you. I'm just adding some comedy. I get um, you. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> So uh, we've spoken a bit about conspiracy theories and I'd just like to talk about my kind of personal experience of conspiracy, the conspiracy theories quickly. Uh, about 10 years ago, a lot of research in huge italics and inverted commas uh, came out around extraterrestrial life. There was that Canadian general who was talking about it. Tom DeLong started his thing and perhaps I was looking for something. I started looking into the stuff and these people uh, and these people and what they were si saying sounded really credible. I was convinced, much to the wincing and cringing of my dinner table <sighs> friends. <laughs> I blocked this out. I have no memory. <laughs> <laughs> then I started reading, uh, then I read Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World. Um, it is one of the most amazing pieces of literature you will ever read. So if you have a chance, check it out. In it, he chronicles his fascination with the stars from a very young age. His parents were very supportive of his passion and took him to science fairs and the like to feed his young mind. At some point in his early childhood, Cole became aware of UFOs and extraterrestrials. He was sold off the bat. He went through school and enrolled in un university um, at the age of 16. He could only get into Chicago. That was the only university in the US that would allow him into, into university at the age of 16 and spent a large portion of his time, much to the ridicule of his professors and peers, looking for actual evidence for UFOs. Um, in the book, he mentions tons of examples, which include crop circles, the faces in Mars, Roswell, and the like. Of the years of belief, Sagan came back empty-handed. And somehow this just flipped a switch in, in my brain, and I was really 
I was really just starting to piss people off by talking about it so much. <laughs> and uh, the, I think the thing is just that this man, this like really brilliant man who believed for most of his life at that point that aliens existed, was forced to submit that there was not a single shred of evidence may, that may could, I... couldn't be explained away by biases, human observation, suggestion, or just plain charlatanry. My, my apologies. The, the thing I would highlight is that it worked because he wasn't forced to admit it. He found that through his own research, knowledge, etc. Yeah, maybe. And, yeah. and that speaks to our whole point. When, when the information is forced on you from the outside, it gets the finger. But when you go there on your own, as he did over, sounds like years, if not decades, yeah. then you accept it. Maybe. He yeah. also didn't just follow YouTube. <laughs> I did my YouTube research, Rob, I don't believe you. So he went on to become one of the most influential people and one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century. He dedicated his life, like I mentioned, to educating people about science and bringing it into the mainstream. Not shooting them down, not mocking their claims, educating them. Through him, like I've also mentioned, the entire field of scientific education was revolutionized. And this resulted in people like Brian Cox, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and even Simon Dan, the, the YouTuber that I mentioned. But still, more than 25% of people in the US believe conspiracy theories are behind the mysteries of the world, and that scientists and politicians are hiding these things, Andrew. We've seen huge increases in the amount of content around this subject online. A few years ago, there were barely a thousand videos on YouTube. Uh, specifically talking about Flat Earth now. A cursory search today gave over 115 million results. <laughs> so, Donald Trump, full stop. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Ted Cruz's father helped assassinate JFK. Democrats funded the caravan traveling from Honduras. And tying in nicely with your point, Andrew which then set off the Pittsburgh shoot. <laughs> <laughs> the, more, the more outlandish, the better. And I once, heard, I once heard this described as like, when you're trying to teach your children, this came from an American podcast of a person who lived in America. When you're trying to teach your sh children kind of rational thought and that kind of thing, but the person they see on TV every single day is this person talking about hydroxychloroquine, about blood plasmas, about whatever the hell. It's very difficult to go, well, you, you've got to, but maybe it's like, it's even better. You know, you've, you've received that baptism of fire already. So when, you, when it comes to you later in life, hopefully you're prepared for, for, for it and, and equipped for it. Something that Rob alluded to is that anxiety, a sense of disenfranchisement, etc., causes conspiratorial thinking. And, and just to go back to Rob's point again, uh, disenfranchisement causes fascism. And that's kind of the, the similar thing in, in this. It's like almost fascistic thinking um, in a scientific way as opposed to a political way. Can I, can I just hop on that? I mean, what, what stood out for me in, in the reading was this idea that, that you will grasp at a conspiracy theory and, and for our listeners, it needn't be a conspiracy theory. It could just be an extreme theory. Yes. You will grasp at an extreme theory where it suits you because, because you feel, it's not about the theory, it's about you. You feel afraid, you feel the world is out of control, or you feel you don't have control, um, and potentially you feel angry. So it's mm. those three things, fear, control, anger prime you emotionally mm. to go for a theory. And, and I would just, just another grenade in the, in the thought pot. Um, everything you're seeing around how people react to data on COVID underlines that. Yeah, well, even, even more. I mean, um, the, yeah, so that feeling of alienation, the feeling of lack of power, what has this pandemic done? Exactly. It's it has done exactly it. done that. And then you get David Icke on fucking noise, voice note um, claiming that he worked for Vodafone for 15 years and he was the chief executive officer or some rubbish. And well, saying you that, see him on Gareth Cliff's TV show. He used to think he was show. Jesus. What? From a man who used to think he was fucking Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no, like. no, he's Jesus' son. Andrew, please get it right. You can't. He's Jesus' you son. Can't. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> was he on Gareth Cliff's t uh, uh, show? 
It was good. I don't know. I just read a piece in the the financial uh, mail. About oh my it. god! I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna find that podcast. It's uh, it's like right up my alley. Just talking to your point again, Joe. People grasp at conspiratorial thinking because of the comfort that it provides. Mm. Um, and it, here I'm going to use a ridiculous example. The thinking behind it is: if only politicians weren't lizards, everything would be fine. You know, if only like people would accept that the Earth is flat, then everything would be fine. Um, if they didn't believe that, they would have to admit that things are beyond even the most powerful people's control mm. and that horrible things just happen at random. And if I may... Mm. Even beyond their comprehension, yes. you know, behind control, you know? <laughs> and, but, yep. but also that what struck me is, is that the world is a very complicated place, but also the world is a very random place. And the famous example here is Kennedy. No, no, there's got to be a, th a theory which explains a bigger kind of dark maniacal thing for why someone put a bullet in this amazing individual's head. Well, guess what? The world could just be so random that someone shot him. Yeah, so just the last few points on this, on this actual topic. Um, some things which seem completely outlandish are actually true, and conspiracy theorists use this to their, to their advantage. You know, it talks to the biases we, we spoke about earlier. But like the idea that th that Russians interfered in the 2016 election, or pretty much anything in astrophysics, like to to believe that stuff is to is to really stretch your mind, you know. And people who believe that the Earth is flat often use that kind of thinking in saying, "Well, that's as outlandish as this." But those things are not created equal. Um, mm -hmm. The three hallmarks of, of false conspiracy theories. I don't know why I put false there, but anyway. Uh, they include contradictions. Uh, the contentions are based on shaky assumptions. And people interpret evidence against the theory as evidence for it. So here, um, the example that I've got down is the alleged mail bomber, bomber's truck in Florida found plastered with Trump stickers taken by Trump supporters as proof that the Democrats were behind the bomb. <laughs> I don't know. That Maybe fucking, that ended me. <laughs> and all conspiracy theories have a nugget of truth, which we alluded to earlier. I think for me, the most important takeaway from that is the sense of disenfranchisement, which causes a lot of these, this kind of conspiratorial thinking. And I think there is a correlation between people feeling more disenfranchised. Um, and I think, you know, in, in the world where we're so connected with everyone else and we, we, have a, a much greater sense of our own personal disenfranchisement, whether that's real for each individual or not. And the, the kind of huge amount of conspiracy theories, the, the increase in the number of conspiracy theories, I think is no accident. Rob, I love the way you put things, man. Would, <laughs> would Alice be open to a three-way relationship? <laughs> <laughs> With your mind. Uh, so open. Although Neil thinks you're you can have my mind. The, have my the most open, it'll be tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> I will not tolerate that kind of mockery. I have a beautiful mind. It is the most beautiful mind. <laughs> I've got plenty of mind to go around, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so Robert? I'd like to circle back to where we started this conversation and I'm, I'm really interested to, to get some more out of Andrew about his perspective on the, the UCT story that we discussed earlier but I'd like to just preface it with, with talking about the idea of having holy cows or no holy cows and I think it's something personally I, I, I tend to I tend towards an argument that says when you're dealing with scientific thought, there should be no holy cows. But I also have to contextualize that in saying I, I am a straight white male in South Africa. Um, I, I've never been offended by anything in my whole life because I've never been subject to anything bad ever. Um, and so it's very easy for me to come across and say no holy cows, absolutely no holy cows. I'm also not religious, so that also helps. Um, and I think there's an interesting discussion to be had about particularly in a country like South Africa, which I don't think is exclusive because I think it's mm. kind of describes a lot of the world. Mm. There are very much historical, um, there, there's a history which informs a lot of the way things are today. And if we're going to be studying the way things are today, particularly in social science, like that story that we're talking about earlier, 
we can't divorce it from being sensitive to what the situation is. And I'd like to hear a little bit more from Andrew about what he thinks about that that story. Yeah, I mean, uh, the idea of holy cows um, kind of reminds me of, of people who complain about political correctness um, and how, you know, how, how can you not let me say certain things? That's that's against my rights and so on. Meanwhile, political correctness is, is it's often there for a reason. You know, uh, it's there because people don't like to be called blacks. They like to be called Africans, okay? And that's that's simple enough, you know? It's it's a, an easy change to make. And I think when it comes to racism in um, <clears throat> in research, that's, that's similar. You tread carefully, and you have to tread carefully for good reason. And that's because there's a context of scientific racism that over centuries has been used to justify colonialism, to justify the subjugation of people, to justify, you know, writing off the things that other people say are important to them because it's just, you know, something that's wrong with them. Um, and I think there's the historical context. If you look behind that, I mean, environmental racism is a thing. OK, if we're looking at this article, um, it's, it's still not unheard of. Does that have to come from fallism? Or could it just be knowing your history? Why do they talk about fallism as if it's some kind of populist force that is that has taken control of the students and not just like maybe the students know their flipping history and world events and they know that conservation um, a lot of the time just is colonial. Um, the real irony of that is that uh, local people before white, white folks arrived did not even need a word for conservation. Life incorporated conservation. That was it. They didn't need a word for, you know, separating nature and conserving nature. Everything they did conserved nature. Um, so, I mean, in light of that, I can really understand the, the offense people took. And, um, I mean, I have, I have other criticisms in terms of just the, the methodology and um, conceptualization of the research and, and so on from a, a pure standpoint of, like, this is bad research. Um, but but uh, in terms of sacred cows, I, I really, I don't know. I think I think this one's justified. Okay, so yeah, so I'd like to to follow up what Andrew's saying with with posing a question to all of us, and that is, when you're dealing with research like this, should there be more comprehensive ethics um, kind of uh, An analysis. Well, should there Review. be should there be a more comprehensive ethics role in in research? And I mean, it's it's one thing when you're studying something like shockwaves, where you know there's no human element involved. But when you're studying something like this, which is specifically about race, maybe there's a bigger role for an ethics committee to play in the research. Maybe there needs to be follow ups. There needs to be something mm. like that because. Was I mean, it a question of, so my, I'll, I'll take a first stab at this. Was it a question of ethics or was it a question of something else? And if it was something else, what was that? Well, I... Th shit research. <laughs> so I think the shit research, I mean, shit <laughs> research can be, shit research can be responded to purely as research. But when there has been mm. an offense, mm. that is an ethical consideration. Well, strange, I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I, I'm happy to be wrong. I, I want to put it out there that is, is asking a sensitive question unethical? Is coming up with uh, a insensitive or difficult answer unethical or is it something else well, well i think it, it all depends on how you ask it exactly. and that's what you're saying and that and that was andrew's point and basically it's the in in a court of law it would be leading the witness the oh, questions yeah. that you've posed have given the the people in your that are completing your questionnaire a set amount of answers okay. for that they can provide you and those questions are Poorly put. Mm -hmm. If you if you study questionnaire kind of um, methodology, how you should be setting up questionnaires, this would that fail. is definitely not how you would put uh, put forward a questionnaire. Definitely so, not. So, so th thank you. I, I would thus propose that it's not a matter of the ethics of the question or the ethics of the answer. Science is about you know getting the answer, no matter how hard it is. It it was about how it was done. Mm. Both the asking. And perhaps the telling. And, and Andrew, you said it well when you use the words tread carefully. <laughs> mm. Yes. 
I like I that. The, the, the tragedy... Wait, uh, sorry, I'm not saying yes, I did say it. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying you said it well, God damn it. <laughs> I think the tragedy... I do feel very strongly about that point. I mean, if your research has potential to hurt someone, <laughs> then you take extra precautions yeah. to make sure it doesn't I think the sad anymore. thing is that Isn't I think that, the research, I mean, the, yeah. the, the thinking behind the research was actually... I'm not going to propose that it was a noble, but I think it was actually good. It was literally yeah. they were trying to do this yeah. to understand why the department had been so. more transformed. I disagree mm -hmm. with that as well. I feel, it feels to me because of their okay. selection of it's the questions. Reasonable. Okay, none of the questions acknowledge that universities or conservationists could be contributing to the problem. That gives the impression that the purpose of the research <laughs> is just to decide who they should shift the buck to. Who are they going to shift the blame to? Sure. Because simply by formulating the mm. questions in those ways, they're not saying, what can we do differently? They're saying, someone else has got to do something differently. Who's it going to be? Not us. Not us. Um, so I feel like it, it could almost and, be... And a, I think that speaks... It, it has to me the flavor of something that is reactive. They've been accused. Why are black people not interested mm. in signing up for your course? And they're saying, oh, shit, well, it has to be fucking, it has to be roads must fall or um, they, do, they never had pets Other or something, maybe, but it's, and materialism it's nothing weird. And yeah, I, Andrew, just to, I'd like to circle around to, to your first point. Um, I, so the leading the witness point, completely taken, the, the question, I think. Um, Political correctness, I'm not sure I agree with you there on, on this particular point. Obviously, I agree with you on, on the subjugation of people and whatever. But it's, I, I think it's also it's dangerous, like painting the fallism protests. Joe, you asked the question earlier, roads must fall, fees must fall. Um, painting the fallism uh, the movement in, a, in an absolutely positive light because... Most of that was instigated by players outside of universities that have huge political connections, not least of which is Black First, Land First, which is an organization that I can't fucking agree with. So there, it's not like... casting it in a positive light? Well, you're saying it's problematic that they're casting it in a negative light. And I'm saying, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying that you can't, pass, can't, can't cast them in necessarily a, a, a halo. Um, so, and there's a, there's a couple of other no, I'm little... Just saying don't go don't go either way, you know? If you're going to say, um, you know, perhaps black people believe in environmentalism because of the Roads Must Fall movement, um, or why not say black people must believe in environmental racism because they know the history? That's all. Yeah, definitely. It, it doesn't matter what you think of the Roads Must Fall movement. Yeah, no. Why I put I, it down to I, yeah, that and I, not to I, just I, no, knowledge? I think, I think we are agreeing here, yeah. Um, just a couple of uh, other little things. The Black Academic Caucus, which um, which Rob mentioned earlier, they say uh, a quote from them: "A hypothesis pinning low enrollment of students in biological sciences to materialist values of Black students, lack of pet ownership, attitudes towards wildlife, influence from roads must fall and fees must fall movements, makes the commentary a joke." There is no hypothesis. It's an exploratory study. So just kind of, it seems like a technicality, but in this kind of thing, it seems that technicalities are important. Um, and also, I, 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 agree with, I agree with the other quotes that the, um, the Black Academic Caucus says, let us not have more of this patronizing and dehumanizing research. Instead, let's have a research that affirms the humanity of all and doesn't seek to insidiously fault black people for institutionalized structures beyond their control. So interestingly, the, one, of the, one of the first kind of lines in the, the exploratory research paper is that probably most of this is down, to, you can put down to the inequalities of the past. So they mentioned that too. I think just for, for me, my journey was, this is science, it should never, there, there should be no holy cows. But I think I've come all the way back around to say that you, you should, probably should tread carefully we're dealing with huge issues and issues that are arguably more important than scientific research, you know, kind of historical inequalities and, and, and subjugation and yeah, so, so here's, almost slavery. Here's a kind of taking that step one, one richer tread forward, I hope, which is I would hypothesize that it is good for this country to have these conversations, to ask these questions. 
it, it, it grows our democracy and our understanding of ourselves and our fellow South Africans. But you must tread carefully. And Rob, you kicked it off by posing the ethics question, and I, I answer it by saying that, that I don't think it's a matter of ethics. I think it's a matter of how it's done um, and that it could be good for us. I think one can separate ethics as well. There are, I mean, there are ethics that are almost implicit in the in the scientific mm. method. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, the uh, you could say that being objective mm. is is a form of ethics. You could say that being rigorous is a form of ethics, and that that applies to to uh, science across the board. Um, yeah. So I think uh, the idea that there must be ethical grounding is, at the very least, in implicit. that sense, uh, incontrovertible. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Mr. Cass, you are looking very thoughtful. Where are you at? Similar to Neil, you know, I, as I said earlier, I, I, I like to, I like the idea that there should be no holy cows when, when we're dealing with science and we're dealing with research. But I must also confess that most of my kind of interpretation of that is things which don't involve human factors. And, you know, like I, I mean, I come from, a, from an engineering background, so that's where my head is at. And when when it gets expanded upon, like in the specific situation and specifically the things that Andrew brought up, it it kind of brings a whole new slant on things. And yeah, I just think I just think again it's 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 understanding where you stand in relation to this research. Um, and mm. I think I still stand by dealing with pieces like this. You know, this was an exploratory study. It wasn't, you know, it didn't follow a proper research basis. There wasn't, you know, a, a big literature review. There wasn't a conceptualization of um, the research question properly. Hmm. Um, and I think it suffered because of that. I think also this is not, it's important to point out that this wasn't peer-reviewed research. This was something that was conducted um, and happened to be put out there, you know, through a, through a process which probably shouldn't have, it probably should have never cleared um, to go into a journal. Mm. And I agree with what you're saying that although this is has caused a lot of fuss and it's caused a, a lot of hurt and it's caused a lot of offense, um, I think ultimately that's probably a good thing because if it didn't, we wouldn't know where we stood and we wouldn't be asking these questions. So I'd, uh, just to, to clarify my, my position slightly, the asking of the question and the having of the conversation I think is positive. The hurt uh, and negative fallout, uh, less so, um, but perhaps unavoidable. I feel like that it's fine to believe in no holy cows, the, um, the point you and I made off air, in a perfect world. South mm. Africa is not a perfect world. Mm. And therefore, you have to be sensitive to the way that people feel about things. Actually, a large part of this entire conversation has come down to your emotion dealing with data, your emotion about how the scientific community d communicates with you. Are you feeling you. disenfranchised? Are you feeling in control? Have you been primed to be thinking rational? <laughs> we are emotive beings. We are. And my emotion... Even academics. <clears throat> Go. I was saying even academics, we're all emotive beings. We're all yeah. swayed. Definitely. Have you got anything else for us there, Andy? I just, uh, yeah, a couple more things. I, I mean, the questions, if you'd asked me... How do we formulate questions to address this topic? Um, I would not have said just, you know, off the top of my head or anything. I'd have said, let's start with a focus group of African students, ask them what their reasons are, and then compile a questionnaire to see how many students agree. Um, mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah. It, seems, it, it just seems that that's obvious research methodology. But what it sounds like is that, and some just threw out some patronizing guesses, the questions themselves are sloppy as fuck, okay? Humans, did humans evolve from apes? Humans are apes. So, so what do you say? Trick questions? No, they didn't evolve from apes? Or, or no, uh, yes, yeah, they must have evolved from an earlier kind of ape, so uh, yeah, I guess we evolved from apes. What must you say? The person asking the question does not understand evolution. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so that's why I start with just saying it's shit research, and, and I don't know why we should even go further than that. Um, and then the interpretation is completely sabotaged by all those flaws. Definitely. You're not going to get closer to the truth with those questions. I, f I feel like we've had a little, well, at least I've had a little awakening um, here. Thank you, Andrew. Mm. 
Any time, pal. And and one <laughs> could argue that that is that is a I think quite beautiful example of how the scientific theory sh method should work. You take something, you unpack it, you take in data, you understand, you challenge yourself, and you come to a new understanding. And that mm. new understanding might be a reinforcement of where you began, mm. or not. But you're open to it. And again, I would urge our listeners, have conversations and read, etc., for understanding, not to be right. I must, I must admit, actually, that in my own research and writing and so on for my master's, I quite often said, like, you know, that or without questioning it, that mm. the reasoning in my mind often went like, I've made this assumption. <laughs> um, I'm mm. going to write it in my thesis. Mm. And it just, you know, the rules say they need to yeah, be citations. Definitely. So I'll just definitely. some citations that support it. <laughs> and yes. you have to, you really have to be vigilant with yourself. You have to watch. Definitely. You have to say, hang on, Andrew, that's selective citation. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not good. <laughs> And, and you use the word vigilant, Andy. I would add mature. You have to be mature enough to, to look for and accept views that are different to your own. Mm. Guys, I, my mode of being says we are reaching the end of our um, rail track here and we <laughs> should bring it to a close. Mr. Gus. Okay, well, I think I'd like to leave everyone with one final thought. And it kind of follows on from the conspiratorial thinking, the, the refutation of scientific evidence. I think being suspicious of power, as we've discussed before, but Hell yes. in general, being skeptical of the world around you, mm. being critical of information that's presented to you, mm. and questioning the motives of those presenting the information to you is basically a good thing. But I think there's enough room within the world of science or scientific thought or rational reasoning to contribute to, further no uh, to furthering our knowledge and trying to be better as a civilization. Rejecting science or adopting conspiratorial views in contradiction of evidence is, I think, regressive. And I think it doesn't help us. It doesn't help society. It doesn't help you. Preach, brother. Preach. Mm. Don't trust yourself. And more importantly, yeah. don't trust anyone else. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. Park, your yeah. closing thoughts. Yeah, before you even think about other people trying to trick you or lie to you or, uh, you know, being biased or whatever, just remember your own kind of humility. Um, I mean, the most, the most dangerous lies are the lies we tell ourselves, and we all lie to ourselves every day. And if you're vigilant enough, you will be forced to, to admit this, and um, it's, it's a, a tough thing to accept. But uh, ultimately, I think it's, it's for the best for ourselves and those around us. In no specific order, memory is unreliable. How we interpret things is much more about how we feel, and we would do well to bear that in mind. Our country can do with open conversations. We must, however, tread carefully. And I'm proud of us on the show and you listeners for going for understanding, not going to be right or wrong. I'm totally right on the new Bright Eyes album though. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. De Villiers. Proud of yourself. Oh yeah, man. I, uh, it, if I can urge everyone to read The Demon Haunted World, it'll change your life. Um, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Cox, amazing human beings. Amazing sense of wonder, amazing sense of kind of just sharing their knowledge, spending their life trying to explain to idiots like me <laughs> how astrophysics work. I, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a beautiful thing, um, and yeah, you you kind of you kind of got to check yourself, which is what we were saying. Check it, check. I think that's all from me. Thanks a lot for joining us, everyone. That was a rough one, a, a long one. Uh, Please consider donating to our Water Tanks for Amadeba crowdfunding campaign. If you haven't already, we'll put the link in the show notes. Show notes for someone, for anyone listening still. Uh, thank you to my comrades, Mr. Rob Cass. Oh, hey. Mr. Janis Landman. Booyah. Mr. Andrew Park. And our technician, Mr. Francois de Villiers. Good night. <laughs>